Okay. So we're uh, asking uh, dumb uh, SEO questions. Uh, each week we answer the questions asked in, in the dumb SEO questions community on Google+. Plus. Um, with us tonight, uh, we have uh, Alistair Lattimore from uh, Convergent Media on the Gold Coast of Australia. Um, Alistair uh, manages um, web websites, uh, well, ha has uh, input into the management of websites uh, um, that um, gross uh, over half a billion dollars. That's billion, not million. Um, Masataki Wasa is webmaster of wasaweb.net in the UK. He's also a Google top contributor on the AdSense and Google Plus forums. Got it right. <laughs> um, the data marketeer, uh, Micah Fisher Kirstner, uh, is um, a, 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 um, a, an organic marketer for Balsam Brands in the United States. Um, Rob Mars uh, is an AdWords aficionado uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, he is a top contributor on the AdWords uh, um, Dutch uh, and English uh, um, Google forums. Uh, am I right, Rob, or did I get it wrong? wrong no? Again. Okay. Oh, wrong again. <laughs> I'm a top you, contributor at. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you go ahead? No, I'm top contributor on uh, the Dutch uh, AdWords and the Dutch Webmaster Forum. Dutch Webmaster, okay. Um, and also runs a, a website um, in uh, the Netherlands, Market Biz with two Zs. Uh, .nl. Um, Linkbuilderworkroom.com is the old uh, website for um, Rob Wagner. Um, and it's shortly to become uh, expressreach.com. Uh, okay. And Tim Kappa. Uh, Tim Kappa, um, some people say that, uh, well, apparently Vladimir Putin uh, refers to Tim as Mr. Fixit. Um, it was uh, Boris, Ye <laughs> Boris Yeltsin was taught to drink by Tim, and when he was stuck at the airport in Ireland, Tim was on that plane, according to all reports. Um, <laughs> when he's not looking after r Russian oligarchs, uh, Tim um, looks after online reputation management uh, uh, in London and manages uh, um, the uh, organic uh, SEO and uh, is it also PPC, Tim, for uh, um, hotel, uh, some hotel chains? No, I don't do PPC, just organic. Just organic, okay. And well, we've got a, a great question for you tonight. Um, is, 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 is organic search dead? Um, okay. <laughs> now, if, uh, we're getting quite, quite organized here, I think, anyway. We, um, you can communicate with us uh, on um, Twitter if you, um, if you want to ask a follow-up question or um, contribute something to our discussion. Um, you can make a post on Twitter and uh, use the, the hashtag DumbSEO questions and we will see it. Um, you can also, uh, we're also tracking comments made uh, on our YouTube channel uh, and also uh, in the, the, the post on the DumbSEO questions community on Google+. If, if you make a uh, post on, on the top post on the DumbSEO questions community, uh, you will see, well, we will see it and we will respond. Okay, our first question tonight. <laughs> oh dear. Oh yeah. Okay, I found it. It's a question from Rob Truslov, and he asks: Would you remove a bad inbound link, even if it is broken? Thanks, everybody. If it's linking to a page, a broken link onto his website, then it um, it's not going to matter. He doesn't need to worry about it. Um, so, you know, this is a this has been a surefire way, for instance, to dig yourself out of um, you know, like link penalties in the past. Um, you could theorize if. Depending on the URL, you could 
404 that page, um, Google will drop all of the links that go to that URL because error, error documents in Google can't uh, persist within the link graph. Um, they can't accumulate page rank. So effectively, they just get dropped out of the link graph as if they were no followed or the links didn't exist. Um, that's obviously not possible for your homepage, um, or you wouldn't want to for it for your homepage. But um, for all of the internal pages in your site, um, you could theoretically for it for them if push came to shove. Um, but I wouldn't worry about removing a, a broken inbound link. Okay. Anybody else um, like to add to that? All right, Rob Treslov, I, I hope um, that answers your question. The next question is from Jatin uh, Hira, and uh, he asks for a strategy to improve ranking. He says, uh, I have a three-month-old domain of internet marketing slash SEO theme, and I found um, the site has a total number of backlinks under 250. I have done submission for it, but... Um, the keywords I want are not found in Google, so uh, I'd like you to tell me some strategy to improve uh, my site's ranking. Ooh. SEO, of course, um, Jatin uh, has to understand that... Um, if, if he's um, wanting to um, um, win in um, uh, like a competitive space like SEO, he is competing against um, other people um, like him who, who do this for a living. Um, so it's sort of like swimming up a waterfall. That and there's a lot of things that one can kind of do um, after just buying a website essentially. So, uh, I mean, you know, if you're if you're looking for for various basics, there's there's a lot of good guides out there on the net. Um, you know, even uh, Moz.com's got a great, very long kind of guide that one can go through and see what kind of tactics uh, and strategies uh, you want to actually implement for your site. Uh, and it's going to vary by what industry you're in and what areas to focus on first as such. Uh, so question it's a little vague and it's hard to give kind of concrete answers without uh, fully knowing a lot of the sites, but you know, the, some general platitudes of making sure that the site's indexable, you know, you've, you've got kind of the keywords you should be Generally, you know, mm -hmm. ranking for uh, that you want to rank for, and people are searching for on the site. Um, you've got kind of the campaigns that uh, and content for campaigns that is going to generate links and interest uh, for your business. And I mean. There's, there's a whole slew, but uh, trying to uh, narrow it down, I don't know if, if anybody wants to provide more kind of concrete areas. I can think of a lot, but it's just it's a very open and big kind of question. Just looking at um, his website, one thing that's interesting is that um, his the website that he listed in the community was Udenchi uh, udenchimedia.com I think. When you go to the website um, it's got about 30 odd pages indexed in Google. His blog is actually sitting on a separate domain entirely. It's not a subdomain. Um, it's completely separate. Um, so, you know, if, if his blog represents a place where he's planning to potentially do content marketing and put out you know, really fantastic content that people might naturally link to because it's valuable. Um, he's not really helping himself that much if he's expecting his Udenchi or UdenchiMedia.com website to rank. 
because the links are going to be pointing into his other domain. Um, so that's probably not really doing him. It's kind of doing himself a bit of a disservice um, in that regard. Particularly when um, I'm just looking across the primary navigation on uh, udenshi.com, where he runs the, the blog from. Um, I don't see any primary navigation as an example that links back to Udenshi Media. So, you know, Google could reasonably think that those two websites are, you know, basically unrelated to one another. Um, the other thing I suppose is, you know, he can't possibly expect to put up a page on performance marketing or performance media as an example um, and have one page of information on his site about that and rank for it. It's just it's completely unrealistic um, because he's competing against businesses, businesses that do performance marketing who um, the internet has a reason to link to them for because you know they're bigger and more established than he is. Um, probably they've got software products or all sorts of things or, or their brands within the digital marketing space. So for him to hope to have a performance marketing section or digital marketing or SEO section of his website and rank for phrases that are related to you know performance marketing, cost CPC, PPC, you know all of those sorts of phrases, um, that's, a, that's a stiff ask and it's probably not the route I would take to start with. So I would say first and foremost he should find out whether or not he wants to run two separate domains. If he doesn't need two domains he probably should merge them. So his blog content is within his primary site. Um, and then he probably needs to start um, expanding out within each of his services um, high quality landing pages for all of the subsections of services that he delivers. For instance, within performance marketing he might deliver um, stuff to do with Google, Yahoo, Bing, he might do remarketing, he might do dynamic retargeting through um, you know, dynamically built flash ads, he could be doing Facebook advertising or stuff into Beidou or Naver or um, you know, Yandex or you know the other places, Twitter, everywhere that does LinkedIn, that does performance, paid media. Um, you know, he would want to have pages on his site that breaks down in detail why he's excellent at each of those things that he's excellent at. And then when he's writing about it, stuff on his blog, and he's putting up case studies or whatever it might be that supports um, the services that he delivers, you know, he should be just naturally leading back to the page within his um, the business part of his website that talks about things like Facebook advertising um, so that people that find his blog which is where he's going to be putting the, the sort of the continuous stream of content through they can find their way back to the page that talks about the services that he delivers which which are the pages that he really wants to rank um, though won't naturally rank without a lot of help Okay, um, Jartin, I, I hope um, that um, uh, covers your question. Um, but feel free to ask on the Dummy CA questions community on Google Plus uh, if um, there's anything else that you want to ask. Shatain Yolmo, who runs uh, a website in Nepal, uh, um, I think it's called KatmanduClothing.com. Um, he asks a question that confuses me. He, he says, um, what, just wondering about semantic markup. Um, will it help to boost rankings and will it replace uh, anchor text? What is the value of sem semantic markup? Is he, is he well, what is he talking about? He talks Sorry, about this two, I think there's two parts of this that he's kind of mixing together. There's semantic markup 
as it's traditionally thought about, which is essentially using good quality HTML for the appropriate content on your site. For instance, H1 tags for headings or paragraphs for paragraphs or lists for lists and so forth. That's semantic markup. Um, then the other part of it would be, um, the other aspect of that would be things like um, using potentially things like uh, schema.org or, or microformats or RDF um, type stuff. Is, is that the other part that he's talking about, do you think? In a no, sense I'm, that I'm, I'm confused. I, I'm, I think he's talking about the latter, since he's saying, would it replace anchor text? Um, I think the answer to that is no, it won't replace anchor text. Is there value to it? Yeah, you bet. You can see Google is leveraging things like schema.org in the search results already um, to produce things like the star ratings or reviews or recipes or um, the information coming out of um, the knowledge graph. Um, there's, there's whole rafts of things that can be helped by having things like schema.org on your site. but it's not going to replace links or anchor text anytime soon. They're going to be around for quite some time. He made a comment on, on the post. He said that he was talking about the correlation effect that Rad Fiskin was talking about. I suspect he's, he's referring to something that Rad talked about, co-citation co and co-occurrence, maybe. I, I'm confused. If only we had David Ameland here. Yes, that would help. He, he could give Chatain the dissertation on semantic markup. <laughs> yes, um, I, I should actually uh, ping uh, David Ameland and hope that he might pop in. I can't talk about that correlation part, though, because I, I read, I did go through and read that article, and uh, um, <clears throat> there's a reason why sometimes you don't want to run correlations on just one uh, link building tool, and it's that uh, OSC didn't find all the uh, links, and one of the commenters in there actually noted like hey if you if you ran this through other tools you'll note that there are actual links going to this page and that beyond the fact of of uh, the the correlation uh, essentially in the end you know there were actual links and had value so the page was likely actually ranking due to links rather than a nebulous theme um, that you know, on its it wasn't its own thing. Uh, that was a cause in it to rank. And not that it wasn't, just that the original article was like we couldn't find any links. And well, if you use this other tool, you'll find some more. So. Okay, um, have, have we covered this, guys? Um, um, Shatane, I. I hope that's enough for you, but if it's not, of course, you, you can ask more. I, Ian Dixon asks, um, what is a TLD? I've seen some, some mention of TLD of late, and I was wondering what people un understood it to mean. So, for instance, my website is at www.example.com. Is that my TLD? Well, it refers to top-level domain, um, and the the alternative variation of that is CCTLD, which is country code, top-level domain. So a TLD would be websites like .com, .net, .org, or similar global um, extensions. A CCTLD or country code domain would be, um, you know, news.com.au or the herald.co.uk or something of that nature. Um, that's what that refers to. Um, yeah. Yep. 
All right. Um, I, I, I think that's that's a, that's a, a, a fair answer to that, and um, I'll endeavour to place some um, reference links um, on the page uh, in the dumbseoquestions.com uh, um, website with this particular uh, answer on it. Um, the uh, so I, I hope that covers it for you, Ian. Um, the, the next question is from uh, Justin Y. Um, J Justin asks. Uh, about posting comments on, on blog posts. Um, when posting a comment on a blog post, do you think it's best to use your TLD or a relevant deep link that's tied to your comment name? I already do both, but I'd like to get some feedback. Here's an example. Blog post uh, would be WordPress tips and tricks. Now there's something original, Justin. Um, and the comment name, uh, John Doe, and the website URL, the TLD or a relevant um, deep link. Anybody, save me. <laughs> I usually just have a Do preference. whatever is appropriate for the readers of that article. Yeah, it also depends on the comment form. Um, the structure he had is Assuming I'm um, visualizing the structure of like comment, name, and URL as a separate line. Um, to me, when I see a website URL like that, it should be going to your uh, to your homepage, to your site, because that just feels the your name associated to the site that you are, not to a specific page, unless it's a bio page, and that that's that's kind of it, kind of. A user, a better user experience, and uh, if you're trying to provide a comment that's to a deep page that's relevant, then you might as well just leave it into the comment field itself, uh, pursuant what you're talking about. So I'm just th that's how I would see it from a user experience in there. I think the other thing to keep in mind here as well is that um, you know the majority of blogs are no follow these days in terms of the links that he gets whether he uses a comment in his author link under his name or if he puts a link inside the body of the actual response. So um, in that regard, it probably doesn't matter. So he's, he's not going to get any sort of search benefit out of that, um, in which case, to me, I would personally um, just link your name to maybe the home page. And if you've actually got a useful link that's relevant to the discussion, then put the link in the comment. But you don't have to hyperlink it, just put the URL in the comment and maybe the blog um, platform that you're commenting on will automatically hyperlink it. It'll probably still be nofollow, but at least the people will know that here's, the, um, here's a clear reference link to more information about what I'm talking about. You know, it, I just think that feels like a better user experience. If I know I like that personally when I go to a blog just to see reference links pointing to stuff to go and find out more information about it. I think you're probably overthinking it. <laughs> OK. Um, well, um, uh, just, Justin, I, I, I hope um, that, that covers it for you. Um, Hyder Ali Sheikh uh, asks um, a question about reputation management strategies. He says, one of my clients uh, is in the share market and he is a renowned person uh, in this business. But due to some uh, misconceptions, um, he, his name has been dragged uh, into the media. And therefore, if we search for his name uh, or his company name on Google, um, we see he's on the first position. But after that, all of the results are from, a news, or from news sites who have written uh, false things about him. These results we can see on the second uh, and even on the third page as well. This happened uh, uh, only last month, but Google is still dis displaying those results. Um, now he is peeved and wants us to help him. I know we can't do anything on third-party sites, but how do I make sure that all of those results can at least get down to at least the second or third page? I'm looking for some kind of strategies from you guys if you have worked on this kind of work before. I was thinking of creating blogs, uh, Facebook page uh, pages, and, and stuff like this. 
Uh, please uh, suggest some more. Um, thanks uh, in advance. Well, hi, to um, If um, I'm guessing that your client from India, which is unfortunate because Tim Kappa has a, a template uh, on how to do this, but unfortunately it's all written in Russian. Um, <laughs> oh, dear, you guys are slow. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we we actually did um, um, some some work for this uh, um, around Christmas time. Was, was it Rob? Rob webinars around Christmas time. Yes, we did. And my first advice is is that he should contact those new sites to remove the articles if they are literally wrong. They will remove them. Yeah, and I'd also challenge the premise of like uh, of not uh, dealing with the the kind of what you can do with the new sites if you've got other articles about you on those or about him on those new sites then you know if you can build uh, build the ability to kind of get people to link to those articles the good ones those will substitute those negatives in, in the search results instead if you can rather and so rather than having to add more social sites or blogs to push them down if there are some positive ones you can swap them out and uh, that could be a, a quicker and easier strategy if you're, if the guy's uh, well known enough. And then the, I'm assuming from the other side point, if the articles are just bashing the other person and not and just use and not highlighting the uh, name, the similar name to your client. So just kind of if there is a an ability there to to note that, that would be. Good if you can highlight the, those other articles of your clients as instead, and make up uh, a lot of exact match domain uh, <laughs> bloggers. <laughs> uh, try to get the they social sites score there, without <laughs> without quality and without backlinks. They score tremendously. Yeah, uh, and in the same vein, create you know if you've got um, the ability to have. Uh, the company's profile author page about your client that will generally show up fairly well. If your client can, um, if he's well known enough, you could have him uh, write articles on decent sites, and that author page you can you can highlight. If he's spoken at previously at conferences, you can try to highlight those author uh, or conference speaker pages. Those rank well. Um, currently, I'm like looking through my list of things of sites that show up for me so <laughs> those are the types of things that can can be beneficial if you try to ping those as, as well okay um, um, Tim Kapp has um, joined us uh, this is a question on um, um, reputation management Tim Okay. All right. Um, hi, Narali. I, I hope that covers it for you. Um, our next uh, question is from uh, our number one fan, Slovomir Zudenik. Um, he asks, is it possible to remove a page from the Google index? He says, um, hello, the best SEO community. He's a remarkably astute guy, Slovomir. Um, Today, he says, today I've got a really dumb question. Uh, is it possible to remove a page from the Google index? As far as I know, meta tag no index prevents the page from appearing in the index, but I believe it doesn't remove it from there. You can remove the URL with Google Webmaster Tools, but if you only remove the page from the SERPs and not from the index, um, but, oh, but you only remove the page from the SERPs and not from the index. Um, what do you think? Uh, thanks a lot for the answers. I gave um, Slora Mia a response on the 
community for this one um, to clear it up. So the basic way this breaks down is, yes, you can remove things from the index, but um, there's only a handful of ways to do it right. So some people think confuse crawling and indexing, and it's a common problem. So Google needs to crawl a URL, typically, to get it into the index. Um, Robots.txt um, is what you use to control Google from crawling URLs. It's not used for indexing, though. So if Google can put a URL, um, they could crawl a URL. You could go and block the URL. Um, it's not going to take the, the URL out of the index, um, at least not for a very long, unspecified amount of time. could be months, several months. And if the link, if that particular page is well linked to um, by either your own website or third-party websites, it may never fall out of the index. Um, because Google thinks it's important to keep in there. Um, so robots.txt is not useful to remove pages. Um, if a particular URL produces an error, so a 404, 410, a 500 error, um, the page will get, ultimately, it will get dropped from the index. Um, of course, you still need to allow Google to crawl the URL. So if a URL was going to return a 404, but Google can't crawl the URL to discover the 404, then that's a problem. Um, so error documents will remove a URL. Um, Slorami was right about the URL removal request. It will remove the URL from the actual search results. Um, it doesn't remove it from the index, and URL removal requests expire, I think, in 90 days, at which point, once the 90-day window lapses, um, Google may put that URL back into the search results again. So URL removal requests are temporary, essentially. Um, if you need it to stay out of the index indefinitely, then you need to take permanent action against that particular page. Um, and then the surefire way, essentially, to do it is use a meta no index. Um, so you either put a meta no index tag into the page head of the document, or you could respond with an xrobots tag, HTTP response header, and apply no index value to it. And when Google crawls the URL, they'll drop the page from the index. Um, those are pretty much the common ones. You could also do other weird things like, which is not necessarily applicable all the time, um, but 301 redirects will also drop a URL out of the index, um, as an example, if, if it's pertinent or useful to do a 301, so it's not always useful. Um, or a, a cross, an off link, or an off URL rel canonical tag also will do it. So you want to drop URL A, you point the rel canonical tag of URL A to some other URL, say URL B, um, and Google will drop URL A, basically. Again, that might not be practical for the particular problem that Sloramir is talking about, but those are two other scenarios that will ultimately remove a URL, um, but might not be the best options. OK. Did anybody else um, want, want to cover this question for slow or follow up any questions um, we've asked um, earlier that we didn't cover properly? OK. All right, um, slow I, I hope um, that that, that uh, satisfies you. Nathaniel um, Breens asks a question about um, the use of uh, meta description on, on posts and pages. Uh, he says, uh, burning question, guys. Do you use meta descriptions on posts and pages? Uh, I've just had an extremely long discussion or argument with someone, and he says that not using them uh, allows Google to rank you for terms that you aren't trying for, i.e. Uh, uh, automatically propagating meta descriptions based on your search. Um, using a meta description will limit your, your uh, ranking options, uh, is his contention. Uh, I say uh, that uh, using a meta description shows Google your preferred description, but it still has the ability to make its own description based on what you write. I think you're right, uh, Nathaniel. 
Um, I also say that it can help um, CTR by, or, or can help the click-through ratio um, by providing a succinct and accurate description for people on, on in the search engine results pages. What do you guys say? I really, really want to know. Well, forget about the, the leaving out to make the description will improve your rankings. Yeah, description meta descriptions don't help don't help directly with with rankings. Um, it, it's mainly used as <clears throat> as a CTR benefit. Um, so yeah, you want to have your own custom written uh, meta description to help entice users to click through. Um, and then each of us kind of generally have different styles of how we want to do that. But uh, you you definitely want to have your own, just like you want to have it in your own in the title tag, and try not to have Google dictate what it wants to show, because you're not providing a, a solid description or title for that purpose. Because um, the the more it the more it looks like it's actually being written by somebody and has a flow to it, the more likely somebody potentially will read it and click through to catch their interest. Versus Google showing something in the middle of a sentence, which yeah, you know, it's it's not very helpful uh, for a user if they are looking through to see which which sites they uh, want to click through from the search results. Yeah, um, it, it's funny how rumors get started. It, it's funny how um, people um, jump on this or that, um, and if enough people shout it. Uh, it, it becomes um, embedded in concrete. Um, it, 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 it's. Um, I, I saw a post earlier this week. I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, it was about um, on on rumours um, in this industry. Um, and uh, yeah, it is funny. Uh, uh, and and ho hopefully, uh, what we do here uh, cuts through a little bit of that um, um, fear and uncertainty and doubt. Um, okay. Um, Nathaniel, I, I hope um, that, that's a good answer for you. Kate Toon asks, uh, or Kate Toon is seeking um, a WordPress SEO by Yoast plugin expert. Um, is anyone uh, on the Dumb SEO Questions community a bit of a WordPress SEO by Yoast plugin expert? I have a niggly little problem that's driving me round the twist. Um, the plugin is auto prefacing my title tag with the site name, even though I'm entering the title tag on the actual page. I've gone through all the settings but can't work out where to switch this feature off. So this turned out to be essentially a programming mistake inside the theme that Kate was using. Um, and one of the community members showed her the file she needed to edit um, to fix this issue. Um, essentially, if you don't write, uh, most of the WordPress plugins will use the hooks or the, the WordPress API to overwrite the default behavior of WordPress. If you don't use, when you're writing, say, a theme, for instance, um, or a plugin, for that matter. Um, if you don't conform to sort of the conventions that WordPress uses in certain sections of it, the plugins can't override the default behavior and get the output you want. So in this instance, the theme wasn't doing it correctly. And when the Yoast plugin tried to alter the title tag, um, it was altering it, but it was being prefixed by additional text that Yoast wasn't putting into the title tag because the plugin uh, had additional text being added by the theme itself. Okay. So, Kate, um, I, I hope um, that's the uh, answer that you want, and uh, we're all looking forward to uh, seeing you jump on to uh, um, our uh, uh, panel um, and answer some of these questions um, with us. Um, you're more than welcome. Um, 
Nikhil um, Gabda um, has a question about, uh, he's asking whether Google is taking signals from social networking sites. He asks, is Google taking signals from social, social networking sites and are these signals a help in rankings as well? If this is true, then there are various tools by which one can buy fake likes, um, shares, more followers, etc. Does Google have any algorithms uh, for this to, to tackle fake likes, shares, uh, etc.? Well, I think I think Google is going <clears> to. <throat> um, well, for, on on the first part, I don't think Google itself looks at plus ones and likes in the sheer fact of those plus ones and likes. But if you understand what a plus one and a like is on a page, it's actually a human visiting it. So from that point of view, that this is obviously pretty good content, um, it's quite a popular place, it's attracting these, so it's not necessarily the likes, it's the actual human interaction and already that the site is pretty visible. If you went and bought a whole lot of plus ones and a, some likes, if you understand the, the whole reason behind that in the sense that it's not going to emulate a human visitor, you know, um, even if, let's say, one of these plus one companies says, oh, it's a human that does this. So a human will log in, find the plus one button, plus one it, and leave. There's no interaction. It's, it, there's no time on site. There's no sharing of the actual content. Um, so in that sense, no, it, it's not going to have any benefit to the site whatsoever. What you've got to remember is it's generally a human behind the plus ones or the likes, which is human interaction on a site. It's not, you know, just forget about this little plus one or this like button. It, 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 it you, if, if you get what I'm saying. <clears throat> In terms of uh, his second part of the question, does Google have an algo? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't see why not. Uh, we've seen on Google Plus itself, if you post a URL that is potentially spammy or Google has flagged it up as spammy, Google actually removes that spammy URL. So I don't see why they would not remove a spammy plus one that did not arrive from a you know non-spammy account, should we say. Yeah, we actually um, stumbled across um, uh, on Google Plus, um, and I'm not going to describe it here um, because I don't want to um, um, make it easier for the spammers. But um, um, we, we fairly well. I think it's true to say, Tim Kappa, that uh, um, we established beyond a shadow of a doubt that Google was taking immediate and direct action. Uh, on a certain facet of the use of Google Plus. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it did include the selling um, of plus ones. Of things that we don't mention here. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so, Nikhil, I, I hope uh, that's a good response for you, mate. Seamus Jacob. Seamus Jokoborskis, Jokoborskis, I'm sorry mate, uh, I, I should have practiced that uh, before the hangout. Um, but uh, um, you, your, your question was, uh, what's the best way for an e-commerce site um, to be indexed more quickly? Um, this is for an e-commerce site with a large amount of product pages. Um, is sitemap um, the only option? Um, no, it's not the only option. Um, you could also um, ping uh, ping services like Pingomatic, as an example. 
um, when the content's getting published. And there's a whole raft of different um, ping notification services. That's just one of the one that's owned by the guys that run the WordPress or build the WordPress product. Um, but the, the biggest influencing factor for getting stuff crawled, um, particularly if you've got a large number of pages, is links. So the more links you've got coming to your site, good quality, reputable links, um, the more page rank you'll accrue. Um, and Google roughly crawls the web in descending page rank order, and each website ultimately gets, let's call it a crawl budget, um, that's proportional to your page rank or your, the equity or the importance of your website. So a very small website um, that's got very little equity but that has a million pages in it is very unlikely to get the million pages indexed. Um, take the complete opposite of that scenario and consider a site like Amazon or eBay um, or Facebook, for instance, who in Google's eyes are some of the most important websites on the internet. They've got literally tens of millions of pages indexed, but they can do that because they've got enormous amounts of equity in their site. And Google is prepared to spend um, an appropriate amount of time crawling through something like Amazon, looking for fresh content, um, even though there's tens of millions of pages for them to crawl through um, across the course of a month or two months. So if he was looking to try and get large amounts of pages into the Google index, I would recommend that he starts building um, links, good quality links, into hub pages within his site, like category pages, for instance, to try and get equity, um, link equity, um, as close to his product pages as he can get. Um, in this instance, it might not be useful at this stage to start building links to individual product pages directly, because he might have too many of them, as an example. Um, and it might serve him better right now to be building them, building links into category style pages or subcategory pages even, um, for instance. And if he wants to start somewhere, he might consider um, start building links into, um, do some competitive analysis on the, the search, the keywords that your products are relevant for. And he might consider building links to start with into categories or subcategories of his site that um, have lower competition than the biggest, gnarliest phrases that, that he could potentially pursue but is unlikely to rank for in the short term, as an example. Okay. Would anybody else like to cover this? Okay, uh, Simas, uh, I, I hope um, th that's a start for you and, and feel free to ask again on, on the WCA questions community if you'd like um, to know more. Um, anybody watching, you can um, talk talk with us uh, on or via Twitter by uh, making a, a Twitter post with the hashtag WCA questions uh, or uh, on the YouTube uh, post or on the WCA questions.com. Uh, community on Google Plus. Um, there's a post there that, that you can add a comment to that we will see. Uh, Jatin Hira asks a, a, se a second question. Uh, he asks, what are the basic rules for writing content for articles, blogs and press releases? Yes, uh, Jatin, that's a, um, uh, a very, very basic question. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to try and prompt. Uh, can somebody uh, uh, help me out here with a, 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 an elevator statement for uh, Jatin? Well, you could start uh, with reading the 23 questions about quality. Uh, posted two years ago uh, about uh, what Google considers quality uh, for an article. I don't have a link at the moment, but if you search for 23 questions SEO, you will find Or something like building high-quality websites also produces that same SERP 
same article that Rob was talking about. Um, the, the elevator pitch for this is it needs to be high quality, just in general. Um, if you're putting out a press release and it's not actually press worthy, then don't put out a press release. Um, if you are putting out a press release because you've actually got press um, something that's actually press worthy, then it needs to be in the format that people that are in the PR industry would expect it to be in. It should include facts, figures, things that can be actually checked and verified um, so that people can quote you. Um, it should include resources, for instance. It might include links to where to find um, photos of the people that are involved in the press release, you know, mug shots, for instance, of them to put into newspapers or websites or whatever it might be. You should include contact details and phone numbers for the company um, or potentially for the, if you're using a third party PR company to run the PR for you, you know, it would include their contact details um, as an example. Um, and the same kind of thing applies for if you're writing for an article for a blog, you know, it needs to be high quality um, and unique in a sense that you don't want to be just regurgitating the same crap that everyone else spits out every other day of the week, or you're just not producing value. Okay. Tony McCreese asks, um, is this done set spam? Uh, he says, I stumbled over this today and have two questions. Would it work and should you do it? From what I understand, it's a WordPress plugin that monitors your search traffic. It, it picks up search terms and automatically creates a new post related to those terms using an article spinner. Then, after three days, it 301 redirects the spun post to your landing page. Rinse and repeat. I personally don't see how spammy articles can gain any ranking uh, um, to pass on in three days. Comments, guys? Uh, yeah, article spinner. That's not usually a good thing. That's going to be in the uh, violation of the guidelines. Um, it, it, it's not that using tools are uh, a bad thing. It's just this is going to be very much a low quality. It's going to create junk content, um, and there's no thought process, kind of, for the most part, behind it. So put that fairly, fairly squarely in the the, the black hat category. Um, there is, uh, I mean, so even, done, even, done even putting. Yeah, I mean, even putting it aside, if you've ever, ever looked at one of those things, chucked your article in, changed your s synonyms or in your this and all, it is a complete load of tosh that it chucks out, right? So, look, it's, it's pointless. It's not readable. It's ridiculous. Um, so, you know... It, Unless you want crap on your site, then by all means go ahead and use it. But it is just ridiculous. And if you try to farm one of those articles out, you know, the only places that is going to publish that article are low quality neighborhoods anyway. So, you know, either way, you're just doing yourself a disservice. So the thing that's interesting about it, though, and, and I don't know how this would actually work long term, but it's an interesting thing to have a look at, is every time you go and create content, even if it's crap content, um, because you go and ping, or you know, if it's WordPress, it'll go and ping the ping services. The ping services ping ping services. So before you know it, your blog has produced a ping into dozens and dozens of websites. And then all of the scrapers will pick up your content and then they'll scrape it and spin it and twist it in 56 different ways. And some of those sites may actually link back to you. And albeit it's completely, it's a crap website, um, some of them will actually link to you. So the interesting thing there is you go and produce the crappy content to basically spread your wares to all and sundry online 
and then redirect that page back to a landing page that's actually got high quality content on it. So in essence, what you're doing is potentially across time, you could be producing um, hundreds of low quality links, I suppose, um, three or one redirected into a landing page. Would it work? Might work for the short term. What, but here's what's going to happen. In, in the midterm, um, this U-viewed little algorithm Google's got called Penguin is going to walk along and he's going to take a baseball bat with nails in it and club you over the head. <laughs> um, because you're going to have so many bad links pointing to your website, 301 redirected or not, your website will get buried. And, and then what you're going to have is hundreds and hundreds or thousands of crappy links pointing to your website that you can't get rid of because there are all of these scraper blogs that no one manages um, and then you'll just have to suck it and your website's tanked and you may never be able to recover. <laughs> I, I would think this is well and truly in the dunce hat spam category. Um, love, love, love the idea of the creative thinking um, from whoever the people are that are making some coin off some crap plugin. Um, but I think it's going to get your website killed. In the, in the, if, if, if not short term, it certainly will in the mid or long term. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, oh, oh geez, it must have been two, two years, maybe even three years ago. Um, I had ran a test on one of these article spinners and I chucked in an article and it's, you know, it turned out, I think, five versions of it, were, which were pretty, pretty bad, as I've said. But then it started submitting it um, just to everywhere, like you just can't believe. And the, sh the, the, the sheer weight of links coming in, yeah, fine, <laughs> but it was just, it, you know, it's just, it, it's just a nightmare. You know, um, just steer well clear. Don't even go down that road. You know, get yourself five authors to write five different articles around the same kind of subject with a different spin on it. And there you go. Yeah, but it, the thing to note is there are tools out there that can do some decent summaries. In fact, some newspapers have been known to use it. Um, but usually those are kind of in sports areas. Um, and very kind of f from information that they gleam offline than it is online and trying to spin articles. So, you know, if, if tools get well enough to be able to write and it's quality, it'll be an interesting uh, time to see how these tools change. But these are not tools you want to be using. <laughs> Um, to sum up, um, this is the most stupid idea known to man. <laughs> that, that's the elevator pitch, Jim. <laughs> okay. Even a black hat would be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this next one uh, was a post by uh, the famous Pedro Diaz, uh, who um, um, shared um, um, one of Matt Cutts's uh, latest uh, clips. And uh, the title of the clip is, How has query syntax changed since voice search has become more popular? I thought this was great. I love these sorts of little questions when Matt answers these. Um, it was un not surprising um, when they first announced the voice search that invariably you were going to end up with more question oriented queries or much longer queries. And I thought that Matt's comments in the video about the fact that they need to rethink how to actually query a voice search because it's, you know, traditionally the more queries you add into your search in Google, the more restrictive the search results become. But by that nature, if you start speaking a question to Google and your question that you're speaking includes 20 or 30 words, 
you would get back no results because your query is just ultra specific and it would never match any documents. So I thought it was you know interesting to see how Google or Matt talking about how Google uh, you know rethinking um, that problem by suggesting that they're trying to understand the query to provide the gist of what the question was asked without actually just firing the spoken words that you've asked directly into the Google search engine to produce the results, as it would if you just typed the query as an example. It was good. Yeah, and I um, um, it's one of those things that just had never dawned on me, uh, voice search. How would you optimize, begin to optimize for voice search? Because obviously when people search by voice, uh, it's going to be subtly different to um, the way that they search by um, typing in, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I think you would have to start thinking about how people would pose those questions. Um, as an example, most people don't have access to this kind of stuff, but if you've ever worked in a call centre before, um, call centres often, you know, you hop on the phone and they say this um, call could be recorded for training and coaching or quality assurance and coaching or training. Um, so imagine the scenario where you've got the ability to listen in on a phone call to hear how people phrase questions when they're talking about a topic. Now, you would ideally, you would kind of want to take those kinds of um, uh, questions that people are talking back and forth to the phone consultant and the customer and essentially start answering those in a website. Um, a good example of this might be a, a FAQ, an FAQ, where the, the question is literally um, the spoken question or, or very close to it um, and then your potentially verbal answer written out or um, or a paraphrased version of the, the spoken answer written out, potentially. That way, you, you know, you end up in a scenario where you've got the phrases that people are naturally speaking, but in text in the page to help Google rank for it. The question, though, then becomes, you know, you need to start analysing when Matt said, uh, you know, that they need to take the gist of the question and, and provide you the results as opposed to just blanket firing that question in. The challenge then would be to find out or understand how Google determines what the gist of a question is to try and start producing the results so that they might distill a 30-word um, a spoken question or a 50-word spoken question into a seven-word query as if it was a, a handwritten query, maybe. So you would end up stalling, I think, in this scenario where you would be pursuing long tail search tactics with a twist. That's what I think you would end up doing. Okay, would anybody else um, like to contribute to this one? All right, our next question uh, is a, a question from uh, Justin Y. Um, and it's about a commonly asked issue. It's redirecting uh, existing URLs to new content. He says, uh, I'm getting ready to make a big change moving my old site over to its new home. Now, my main concerns are, are the redirects. My question is, do you think it'll be best if I move my old pages over to the new domain without changing any content and URLs or redirect the existing URLs to my new content that's relevant to what I had before? I'm sure I'll leak some juice, but I'd, I'd like to get some honest feedback before doing anything. I want to make sure that I'm not shooting myself in the foot, um, move it or lose it. So Google have got guidelines on this about moving websites, um, which you can find inside the support, the webmaster section of Google's support site. But if you query something like um, 
moving website or moving a site or moving your site will we'll produce you the help document from Google about this. Um, but the, the basic thrust of this is they suggest in general that you move one thing at a time. Don't move everything. So if he wants to change domains, then he should leave his website alone and change the domains. Don't change anything else. Once Google's processed all of the 301 redirects from his old domain to his new domain, um, and that's and he can no longer see his old domain in the search results, then he can start um, thinking about redeploying his new version of his website, or updating all of the content, or updating all of the title tags, or doing whatever he's going to do in terms of his new website. But as a general guide, it's do one thing at a time. Otherwise, if he does 10 things all at once and something goes wrong, he won't know what it is that's gone wrong to fix it. Um, and then he could end up fixing, in inverted commas, the wrong thing um, and potentially doing himself even more damage because he's fixed something that wasn't broken. Yeah, and I've, I've back when I was on the client side, I'd see that happen oftentimes. And uh, I cannot stress enough of trying to do do things one at a time. Don't, just as Alistair, Alistair said, it, it's move the domain, then make all the, all the, the, the different changes you're going to make because something breaks and it, almost always something, you know, it, it's, it's hard not to. Something in, inadvertently always will. Um, trying to find out what the problem is is going to be very difficult if you do too much all at once. Um, so even from a, purely not even from a, an SEO side, just trying to kind of keep everything in an event log and, and understanding what's been done, it gets very difficult if you push everything on the same day. So that's just, uh, you know, uh, something to, to, to keep in mind. So to put this into a practical example, um, at, uh, at my work, we're rebuilding one of our hotel websites at the moment. Um, and it's about uh, 400 pages, 500 pages in size, something along those neck of the woods. Um, it's got a new design, um, new content, new... It's a, it's a new website on the same publishing platform. Um, as we've rebuilt this... So this is, this is what Micah and I just talked about in action, literally, right? As we've built out our new website, um, while we've deployed new content, because we've had copywriters rewrite all of our content, um, some of the things in our site I've deliberately not changed. As an example, um, I want to clean up our information architecture in the site. Um, I've not done that as part of this deployment because it's another thing to add to the list. Not because I didn't have enough time, but I'm deliberately choosing to hold that back. Similarly, I know that all of the meta tags, so title tags and meta descriptions in our site, they could be a lot better than they are today. But again, um, we're deploying so much other stuff that I want to try and minimize the amount of change. So I'm literally redeploying a completely new site with the exact same title tags, the exact same meta descriptions, as we've got today. But I could have deployed new title tags, new meta descriptions, new content. Similarly, we're going to move these websites onto .coms instead of um, .com.au's at some point. I could have done that now. Again, don't want to do that. Too much change. So the lesson here in terms of the, the practical application of this is you want to definitely try to minimize the amount of change you push through in any one step, um, because if it if it's not very very carefully managed, um, it can go horribly wrong, and it can happen very very fast. Um, we've done website deployments in the past where say it's a thousand pages or more, and we've had no choice but to redeploy the whole thing in one go. New CMS, new URLs, new website, new information architecture, new content, new design, new new everything when we've acquired a hotel chain. Um, and that is, um, you need to be anally retentive in your attention to detail. And I mean anal, to the point where, you know, we exported every crawled URL inside the site 
for six months. And I went through and I mapped out thousands of URLs um, that have been visited, married that up with traffic profiles inside the site to see what stuff we link to, what stuff Google links to, what stuff third parties link to, you know, and it needed to get meticulously handled. But the net result of that was we migrated to this new platform, new, completely new website. We came out the other side clean and everything was actually better than it was beforehand. But there was a huge amount of work we needed to do to make sure that that process moved smoothly. Um, and it's not something that I would advise. We had no choice. So if you've got an option to not do a big bang approach and do it in chunks, do it in chunks. You, you only have to do two stage this across three months. You know, move it to a new domain. Four weeks later, that'll be done. Then start doing content. Four weeks later, do a design. Four weeks later, do something else. You know, but wait until you know that whatever the change is that you're doing, that Google has accepted those changes and embedded them in. Okay, does is somebody else, um, would, would somebody else like to cover uh, um, migrating to a new sign? Okay. Right. The, ne the next uh, the next question um, was a post um, made on um, the Damasio questions community on Google Plus by W. E. Yonk, uh, who does um, all of the work um, involved in um, cutting up um, these hangouts into uh, bite-sized morsels of intelligence. Um, he, um, he headed it, uh, is this the beginning of the end of organic search? And um, he was referring to a post uh, by um, a, a sometime panellist uh, here, uh, Richard Hearn. Um, and his, in his post, uh, Richard said this, I think, I think it's worth repeating. Um, I'll even take my chewy out for this. Um, Richard said, Google is killing organic search. Uh, in fact, you could argue that Google isn't an organic search engine anymore. The days of organic search results are now over. It's frightening to see how Google has gone from having a goal of getting searches to an external endpoint as fast as possible to one where keeping searches interacting with Google content is the primary consideration. To any webmaster who still views Google as a partner, you need to wake up and see the world for what it is. Google does not care about content website owners. Google does not care about what is best for searches. Google cares about Google. Richard goes on to say, I still hope that content owners will revolt someday and that large portions of the public web will become disallowed to Googlebot. That's the only way I can see content and site owners reclaiming the web. I live in hope. Well, I don't know. Maybe we should all join and uh, march on the Googleplex. Um, some, of, some of us are going to die. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I feel for Richard, and um, I... I, 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 I I think exactly uh, the same way, um, but um, um, it's Google's game, and um, I, I don't think there's um, any. T I mean, currently uh, they they use the metrics to make sure that there's public satisfaction. If the searcher is satisfied, there's no beating that. Um, what Google's doing is is morally wrong. Um, well. It is if you believe in fair play, um, but it is morally wrong. Um, but um, it's their game; they're, they're entitled to set the rules. And, well, they're going to uh, have. They're going to have to. There will be. Uh, I mean, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in the UK, at some point, they will have to watch their game plan in terms of competition commission, and you know, if if they want to 
so you know they're going to push it as far as they can, obviously. Um, but yeah, you know. In fact, they're going to push it further than they can, and then they'll be um, brought to the competition commissions in the UK or Australia <clears throat> or the European Union or wherever, and then they'll take one step back from yeah, seven yeah. steps too far past the line. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and they will just satisfy the requirements set out by the court to meet um, yeah. fair competition and regulation requirements. But, you know, it's their sand pit. Everyone wants to play in it, so you play by their rules. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. But I think Richard's... Uh, right on cue. I, I, I thought Rod Ma Rob Mars, you'd forgotten to disconnect. Uh, but there he goes. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's, um, uh, look, I've got nothing intelligent to say. I'll have to shut up. I think the, my biggest concern <clears throat> with the changes that's happened of late with this is it used to be, back, back in the day when it was 10 blue links, Google's goal was to get you from Google to where you wanted to go as fast as you could get there, essentially. And as Google's matured as a business and they've released more and more and more products, um, their goal, bit by bit, has been to send you back into Google-owned properties. It, and I think, I understand why they're doing it, but to some degree, I just don't think that it's right. Because I, as an example, um, take Google Plus. You, you shouldn't have to, if you do a search for a business or a, cat, a, a category search where Google turns up um, uh, business listings out of Google Places or Google Plus Local, the, the best result, I would argue, the best result for that is just take the user straight to the website of the business. Um, but regularly, it's I think it's often unclear um, where where you're going in terms of the, the clicks. Um, you know, is it going to take you back into places or or somewhere else? So I think um, I don't know. I I just uh, I think that they're, they're definitely pushing hard on on lots of different fronts. And, um, and I know why they're doing it, and, and they're entitled to do it. And I think at some point, different competition commissions, like Tim said, will um, will take them up on it at some point. That assumes, though, that there is something, um, there is a market called the organic search. And I have a feeling that, that the, in the long term, what Google is trying to do is to create a search within the Google or within and related to the Google Plus landscape in which they can favor Google entities above others because it is if you like a search within that product sphere which is not organic if you see what I mean yeah so you know if you if it's organic then you know it has to be a level playing field Google entities may appear towards the top of the list but that's because they compete on the f on the same level on the, you know they are better in comparison to other sites using the same criteria whether that's actually true or not is you know a matter for people to discuss um, but that but they can't favor Google entities unnaturally in organic search or they shouldn't be able to do that now, but if people were to move over to a search within and related to Google+, Plus, then they can do that. And I think that's why Google has been trying to push Google+, Plus to existing user bases of different, uh, different products. It's not the only reason, but I think it is one of the reasons. So, in a sense, the, question, the big question is, how large a market will organic search be in the medium to long term? You know, we're looking three, five, seven-year span from now. 
how much of the search that people conduct will be organic, as opposed to searching a very specific, sort of personalized, localized, individualized, if you like, sets of searches. I think um, if you, if you think about how this pans out for Google, though, you know they make ninety five percent of their income out of adverts or advertising. It's not out of all of the other things that makes the money, right? So, in that regard, you know they are incentivized to send them back into other Google products because, as an example, um, you come to Google search, do a query. There's ads, which is fine, um, but then there's an opportunity for you, for a user to click an ad, and then Google get paid. Um, but then you could go and set up other vertical searches where there's other opportunities. So as an example, you click something and, oh, gee, I really want to find out where the business is located. So then you go and click into um, the Maps page or Google+, Plus, and then suddenly you're in this position where, oh, look, there's more advertising opportunities for a business to potentially pay Google to have an ad somewhere on that page. Or if it's in a hotel industry, you know, you go into Hotel Finder. Well, guess what? OTAs spend big bucks to put their prices inside Hotel Finder, or it flights. You know, you go into Google Flights, same deal, right? So you can see the the end game for Google is for them to to create great products that users want to use because it's a great product, and ultimately send traffic to it, even if it is subtly, because it represents potentially a second bite of the cherry. Um, for an advert or a user to click an ad, or it's another opportunity for an advertiser to give Google more money. You know, if if the only product Google has is Google Search and it's the it's the only product within Google Stable that makes the money, then and then they don't have YouTube and they don't have AdSense and they don't have Maps and they don't have all of these other products that make the money. Then ultimately they're completely reliant on Search as a product growing. To make more money, but then as soon as they go and release another product like Maps, well, that's a great product. How how can we make Maps more useful? I know, we'll give business owners an opportunity to put their business information into Maps. Well, now that makes the Maps product more valuable. Well, now you've got this position where people want to go to Maps because it's just an amazing product, um, and it provides advertisers an opportunity to put. You know, effectively, location-aware ads, and it's another opportunity for people to give Google money. They may never do it, but the opportunity is there. So, you know, imagine, um, look at Facebook as an example. When they started, their remit was just build a great product. Don't worry about advertising. We'll sort the money up later. And then, bit by bit, they've been feeding in advertising. For Google, for say Google Plus, arguably. Their goal could be: we've got no intention to run ads in it, and and there may be no ads inside Plus for five years more, even. And then at some point, when Plus gets to five hundred million users, active users in it, in five years' time, and there are um, a big threat against Facebook at a billion users or whatever it might be, and they're not at two hundred fifty million, maybe they'll start providing an an ability to put ads into. Google Plus, at which point they've got this huge captive audience and an opportunity for advertisers to put potentially hyper-targeted advertising into Plus, reaching into you know the、um, demographic and psychographic data that's available in Plus, like it is inside、um, uh, Facebook, or or maybe it's going to go the other way. Maybe all of your demographic and psychographic info out of Google Plus will feed its way back into AdWords from a targeting standpoint. You know, you can already do interest-based advertising and things like that through AdWords. But what if the interest-based stuff wasn't based off、um, sort of more broad brushstroke stuff, and it was based off more concrete, hard evidence that you're you, anonymous still. But but truly based off the fact that you're you, and that somehow your browsing habits or you as a user is available to AdWords, 
keep in mind here, and I've, I talked about this a long time ago when I had my tinfoil hat on, um, that as, as Plus grows as a product, and more and more websites carry Google Plus um, buttons on their site, um, this gives Google an ability to run effectively Google Analytics for the internet that they can actually use. So there's a demarcation in Google between Google Analytics, AdWords, and Search. Chinese wall type stuff, right, where people don't talk to one another because it's a competitive um, issue for Google. They have to keep them separate. So, okay, Google Search can't use data from Google Analytics. But now come along and imagine that as a user, you're logged into Google. That's great. Google's um, Plus runs on plus.google.com, so all of your cookies can flow back across the Google infrastructure. This is all feeling very good and common. Now imagine that you go to some arbitrary website, doesn't matter where, and they carry the Google Plus button. Suddenly Google knows you, as a user that's logged into Google, what your browsing habits are. What? Just imagine what you can do with that. It's it's no it's no longer opaque information. It's um, in, it, okay. Extrapolate forward from that. Google could come up from that and say, um, this website deserves to be ranked higher because it produces amazing engagement metrics. Could have no no links on, hypothetically, it could have no links at all, but because of the plus one and the button, like the, the, the plus one JS file that's on there, and users being logged into that website, Google could see just this epic amount of engagement inside this website. They could be feeding that data back into the ranking systems. Like, you, you, can, you can push this to all sorts of scary, wicked places if you take a step back from it. And it's completely within the realm of Google to do it. Like it, it, it's not like pie in the sky crazy talk. This is this is completely achievable for them. Um, you know, and if they if they're not doing it, they're going to do it. I, if I was Google, I would do it because it makes my advertising product more awesome. Yeah, and I think that's where um, they would have to separate that. You know, sort of. Um, all the, uh, if you like, the Google Plus related data, so they have to siphon that off and leave the organic search as it were, as it is. Because you know, if they were using Google, for example, Google Plus information, then that really is pushing a product in a different market, which really wouldn't be allowed, I think. Um, but it would make total sense within the Google Plus landscape. So you know, you could say that you know we can extend this new plus one thing, um, not only within the Google landscape, but if you say, okay, I'm going to plus one this particular external web page, and you post that, you share that, or post that uh, on your Google Plus stream, and other people plus one that, you know, in that sense, the web page is going to benefit, not just within. You know, it's not going to be self-contained within the Google Plus landscape alone, but it's going to link out to, if you like, the external websites. And that's a totally, in a sense, that's a totally different market from organic search as such. You know, it may fulfill the similar thing. They may, you know, you may ask the similar kind of questions, but the answers you get from searching organically and searching if you like, it's an extended or an enlarged, enhanced version of Search Plus Your World. Now, those are going to pr produce two different sets of uh, results. And that personalized search you know, is, is going to get more and more accurate, more and more, um, as just to the point, as people engage and use Google Plus products. You know, plus ones, sharing, resharing, things like that. And think, yeah, I think so. To think that um, you could, that, that it would be fair game for Google to think, so in, in the context of, say, Search Plus Your World, 
do you think it would be fair game for Google to, let's say you and I connected through Google Plus. Um, I browse a website and I love it, but I've never shared content from that website before. But because Google know that I love the website, because the plus one JavaScript file tells them this, uh, and I go to the site every day and I view 45 pages and I do it relentlessly because it's just amazing. Do you think that it would be fair game that when you go into a search for something, that my passive, my, my active engagement with the site, but non-sharing of, of the content, like no pluses or sharing it into Google+, Plus, could influence your search results through search plus your world, effectively? I think that's within the realm of the possible. Um... You know, Google would have to get it right in the sense that is that the kind of thing that uh, people want? I mean, people may visit certain sites um, about which they don't want others to know about their visit. Um, so it's well, it that's good. It doesn't yeah. have to tell you that the search result why it's coming up. Sure, sure. Like you know, it'll get the little the little blue head beside it to say this is a personalized result. Mm. It just, it doesn't need to tell you that it's there because exactly. I was browsing the site necessarily, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that, I think that, I think that could happen. Um, you know, not in the organic, but in this, if you like, search plus your world kind of setting, then I think that, that would make sense because the assumptions are that, you know, you are connected with other people, you follow other people, and you're likelier to... Um, appreciate the content that others in your social connections are looking at. So, yeah, I think that's entirely plausible. That brings me to an in interesting question. A lot of money in advertising at the moment is made by uh, the enormous waste you make as an advertiser. If Google were to improve not the CTR, but the, the conversion rates, because they target so well, that could lower their AdWords income. On the flip side, you could increase it. Yeah. <laughs> Till a certain level. Well, uh, this, 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 is the, this, is the, this is the Amazon play, right? Um, when you when you hear Jeff Bezos talk about Amazon, um, he's completely uninterested in the share market, in in a sense that people will buy and sell shares to Amazon, and he has been quoted about a thousand times as saying, "If you're the guy that buys and sells Amazon shares on a whim, I don't want you investing in my business. Go and buy someone else's shares to flip them." Um, I don't even and he and he talks about making business decisions at Amazon. He says. Um, I don't even like making three-year decisions. Five years I'll tolerate, seven years is good, ten years or better is awesome. Why is ten years awesome? Your competition becomes completely irrelevant when you start talking about ten years as a, um, as a investment for Amazon to you know, get ROI or become successful in some new venture. So imagine for an instant um, when Amazon or originally talked about um, releasing AWS, the Amazon Web Services. They got absolutely crucified when they announced that they were going to release all of the technology to the public to use because Amazon is not a technology business. They're a retailer that sells books or you know, whatever the um, stock exchange and all the analysts' opinion of Amazon was. Yet fast forward and now Amazon gets billions of dollars of income out of AWS annually long term, right? Now let's apply this to Google. In the short term, let's say that the targeting inside AdWords becomes so amazing because of Google+. Advertisers are not going to suddenly turn around and drop um, two-thirds of their ad spend because the targeting is so amazing. Because not enough users are using Plus yet. So what's going to happen is you're going to have a really big chunk of users um, to start with and a little tiny bunch of users using Plus. And then what will happen is they'll go like that. And as that shift of pool of users shrinks from 
or grows into Google Plus and the targeting pool becomes more and more uh, large and advertisers get more and more opportunity to have hyper-targeted ads, it just makes the Google product better. And smart advertisers will start moving more money into better targeting. And as the internet continues to, to you know, have deeper and deeper roots into everything that everyone does in the world, more and more businesses will have no choice but to come online because it's just it's the way of the future. At which point, it's got you know Google are in this blessed position to say, well, we've got the most amazing advertising product on the planet. No one can touch it. It's that good. We're 15 years in front of our competitors um, because of all of this hyper targeting. Like, I don't think it would it would cause their stock price or their income to fall as a result of this long term. Um, you know, it's it's just going to be a good thing for them. I think also, um, I mean, it's not that Google's results are that that I mean. Great. The Google's asset is that it has um, users um, convinced that they will get the best search result from Google, and uh, that's their asset. It, it, their search results really aren't meeting that uh, meeting the, the hype. But um, I mean, they're, they're magnificent and wonderful. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But they're not what people think they are. There, 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 there are flaws, and um, um, I mean, recently that they, they put pressure on um, one European country because uh, they wanted to use the term in some document "ungoogleable." Um, well, you know, um, there are just so many things which are ungoogleable, um, totally ungoogleable. Um, if I want to buy a, a set of Goodyear Excellence uh, for my car from the, the the retailer, you know, within 20 k's of me, um, I can't find those results on Google. They're just not there because that Google expects um, the, the the retailer to be buying PPC. Um, so the the big asset is the habit, the user habit. Um, and as long as they maintain that user habit, they can do what they want. They they, they can they can put um, bad results in front of good because that's what that's what earns the money, and uh, uh, the organic search results don't. Um, until the user perception changes, until uh, the user finds out that you know they're not getting what they paid for. Does that make sense? Okay, so still we we covered Richard's. Quite, um, oh, still quite scary that that your your own search uh, history and that of people connected to you will decide what you will find on the internet. Hmm. Well, we we that's we're very not, scary. <laughs> if we are speculating, you know, we think that's what yeah, may course. happen. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it's interesting because. Uh, I'm not so sure how much more the mileage the behavioral targeting has um, in that I would think mo more and more browser browsers will have do not track features as default in the future and there may be sort of movement towards regulation about tracking people's behavior so but the Google Plus actually circumvents that because people sign in and then Google can retrieve all the information from their Plus activities, as it were. Whereas I think other ad agencies and companies that rely on behavioral targeting, they, you know, they may struggle. Yeah, but imagine that, that you normally do quite uh, expensive uh, Shopping on the internet, and 
until a point that, that you can't find cheap offers anymore. Well, that, 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 that wouldn't be me, Rob, that you'd be talking about Masataki Wasa and Alistair Lattimore and Tim Kappa <laughs> and Rob Wagner. They're, they're the blokes that do all the expensive shopping. Um, and you're still getting the, the cheap offers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but that kind of, of weirdness, that, that's puzzling me always. Hmm. Um... Yeah, I mean, when you think it's about already it, it's mean, already the case that when it's not on Google, it, it's not true. <laughs> yeah, for a lot of people it is. Yeah. Um, and I know yeah, it's but... wrong. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you can uh, tackle that in a different set of ways. I know many people... Uh, who don't, who count or don't distinguish between organic results and advertisements? They think whatever appears at the top is the best, is qualitatively the best result. Um, not the most relevant to the query, as such. Not an ad, but many people think that yeah, the the top thing, the first thing that appears on my Google um, search results, that's the best thing. I think most people are just lazy and click on the first result that matches their their search. Mm. Yeah, um, it's not it's not laziness. I think that some people genuinely don't distinguish or can't distinguish between ads and organic search results. I, I think we should also pull in uh, another question that was asked this week on the WCI questions community um, because it's so. Uh, it's so um, well tied into what we're discussing, and, and that was a, a post. Um, actually, it was on exactly the same subject, uh, the, exactly the same article that prompted uh, Richard Hearn's post. But uh, I, I just wanted to bring up the point uh, to cover a technology in, in technology and businesses question, um, and, and that specific point: thirteen percent of Google search results are, are organic results. Um, or am I just r mindlessly rambling, trying to, to make two things fit into one? No, um, I'm glad you brought that up because it does kind of fit. Um, yes, only 13% of Google search uh, screen are Google organic results is, is the title of that question. Uh, very interesting. I think that if Google can make it 1% uh, organic results, they would do that. Um, and they're, it's in their rights to do that, uh, as long as they don't lose any search volume. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that there's a misconception, and this is where, from from an SEO standpoint, if if you're doing, if you're doing, if you're running your business for this, and in, in this, and in everything that you do is for strictly SEO, and you're you're relying on the Google organic search results for your business to work, you're in trouble because you're, and you're vulnerable and you should not do that. Uh, and if that's the only way your business works, I would suggest that you immediately start looking for other ways to generate revenue uh, because it, it's, a, it's a vulnerable place to be in the organic search results. Google changes an algorithm, they tweak it, they do a data refresh or do a whole algorithm update, and you could be gone. So there's no guarantee that you're going to be there. There's no guarantee that you're going to get, a, that you're even going to show, I mean, I, above the fault. There's no guarantee that they change the local search results, then all of a sudden you go from being getting a, a whole lot of traffic to getting no traffic. So it's vulnerable. It's 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 not something that I would, I, I definitely wouldn't classify the Google organic search results as is a is a secure form of of generating revenue. But I think it's a legitimate question. Um, it, you should not be putting all your eggs in the SEO basket. But there's things that you can do 
that work hand in hand with SEO that won't will help you with SEO. Um, so you shouldn't ignore it completely. So I think there's a balance there. But um, I, I to, going back to some of the stuff that you guys were talking about earlier, you know, Google runs their business. Uh, Google runs their business here in the United States, and there's a slightly different attitude in the United States and, and than there is in the in the European um, countries. Um, uh, here in the United States, companies are judged by comp or, or crushing the competition, gaining market share. There is no fair play um, from from that standpoint. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it is probably in the Cayman Islands, but that's um, that's the that's their attitude. So Google has to make money to satisfy their stockholders, and Google's going to do that. So they're going to make the decisions uh, about their business based on you know, what's going to be best for the sh for the shareholders. At the number one. So as soon as you're going to see advertising on Google Plus, um, as soon as it makes sense for Google, and if if Google captured what they needed to capture as far as market share tomorrow, you would see ads tomorrow afternoon because that's how it works. So I I think you know you have to put it in perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I think. I mean, I think what I think sometimes um, people think Google as something other than a private, you know, an enterprise, which it is, and you know, its primary objective it must be and should be towards its shareholders. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think many people tend to forget that element because Google is active in many areas, and then they have um, uh, do things that are, you know. That's in genuinely good, and and you can't see how that how that's exactly going to make money. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that you know it will you know it it will make it will make decisions that will be best for its um, for its shareholders. And if that means ads on Google Plus, then there will be ads on Google Plus. Yeah, it's it's definitely not your, you know. Some people take have this uh, come from the standpoint, you know, why uh, I'm a webmaster, I'm a partner of yours. You should you should be helping me, and that, to a certain extent, that is true. But ultimately, they're they're beholden to their their shareholders. They're a corporation, so they they have responsibility to their to the general public and to the to the people that own stock. And they have to meet numbers. There's a certain, and it's not even up to them, right? The the the, the analyst will say will will say you have to have X amount of growth, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. This is what our expectations are, and and Google can say Google has to meet those, or they're going to get raked over the coals on the stock market, and that means their stock is going to go down, which means their money is going to be less. And there's a whole there's a whole thing there. Um, and I think they care about that. I think Larry Page cares about that very much, that he wants to prove to uh, the, his critics that he can run a company. I think that's very important to him. And, and all that's fine and good, and I don't have any arguments about it. And that's why you, you see the results, um, only 13% of the results uh, above the fold, are, or 13% of the results are, are organic. That's why. Um, that doesn't even make sense. Thirteen percent. You know, you have an organic search engine, but only thirteen percent of this. Of, from my understanding, only th I think it's saying only thirteen percent of the screen. Well, it's it's a bit uh, overdone because he he's counting the white as uh, non-organic. Uh, if I count up the figures. Yeah, I think he takes the whole screen, doesn't it? And doesn't he? And it's the actual. He counts as a thirteen percent the actual results bit, right? So it's not thirteen percent of the, if you like, right. the visible contents bit. It, it, in, it includes the white spaces as well. That that's how I understood it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's a big, there's, I think, <laughs> there's a huge asymmetry, isn't there, in how um, changes affect Google and webmasters. You know, if Google were to make slight change, you know, it may, it may cause some sort of dip or problem, but you know, it's not going to bring Google down. But if a webmaster is hit by something or rather, then that could that could well mean the end of that business as an ongoing concern. So there's a huge disparity in terms of the the if you like huge disparity and how disproportionately it affects certain people or one one side of the equation than the other. Okay. Well, I, th I think we've um, covered this re really, really well. I'm sure um, Larry and Sergey are listening in and taking it all on board. Um, okay, we we have um, another uh, a post on um, the um, uh, Dumb SEO Questions community on Google Plus uh, from W. E. Yonk. Um, gee, I don't know. We, we we didn't hear from him for six months and. Uh, all of a sudden, it's like he's on steroids. Anyway, um, it's uh, headed. Uh, well, it, he, it's a post on uh, an article from Micah Fisher Kirstner, who um, just had to leave us uh, um, to go to work in the USA. But um, it, it, the post is headed "Why Chasing the Algorithm Matters More Than Ever," and uh, W. E. Yonk uh, took an expert from the article, an excerpt from the article. Um, he said that Google frequently stated that webmasters shouldn't chase the algorithm and only build great content. But how would an uh, SEO do the job without looking at the algorithm? The value of data and making connections is only increasing over time and at the speed of which te technology changes, the more one continues to refuse to chase algorithms, the faster you will fall behind the data marketers um, your competitors are using. This is another example of why using big data properly matters matters to win in the SERPs. There are many more questions answered in the article and there, there, there are many, there are even more to ask. To me, this is W. E. Yonk, every subheading could be a huge blog post on its own. I agree with that sentiment. The subjects that Micah combined in this article are so huge that it's a little bit much and Micah did a really great job on embedding them into the overall story. I, I love reading an article that keeps me rethinking things um, and um, you know and, and he said he just picked up um, on, on just that one quote above um, I, I'd, I'd like to hear um, your, 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 your comments on this guys maybe uh, Alistair since you have to go early um, you could um, go first That'd be different. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it was a, a really good um, post by Micah as well. Um, I find this really funny when people would say, you know, don't chase the algorithm because SEO is indirectly, it's all about chasing the algorithm and getting in front of it. Gr granted, you should be moving to where the puck is going, not where it is today, but to move where the puck is going, so to speak, to use a, a hockey um, analogy, you, know, you need to understand how the algorithm works so that you can sort of anticipate where Google would theoretically be going in a year or two or five years down the road. Um, so I find it um, quite funny when people would say, you know, don't chase the algorithm because Mike is right, you have to chase it. it you, like the, the notion of saying just create great content and Google will reward you is complete horseshit. It just is. Um, and I completely understand that you need to create great, great content, but if that's the only thing you do, you will go nowhere. It doesn't matter how good the content is. It could be the best content on the planet that has ever been written. It'll go nowhere if no one finds it. So it has to be promoted. You know, at which point, you know, how do you promote it? Well, you could promote it using all of these 
four tactics. Go to Fiverr. Go and do, you know, X from a type crap. You know, you could do all sorts of things. But all of these things don't necessarily lead you to success. So I think you need to understand the algorithm because otherwise you, you might miss, you'll miss step and uh, ultimately, um, you know, penalize yourself. Not necessarily with a Google penalty, but, you know, long term you're penalizing or, you know, yourself through your poor actions or poor choices. The other part of it that I thought was um, the, the, the data marketer aspect of that, I think, was an interesting part as well. And again, W.E. Yonk has picked up as well. There's a lot of stuff that Micah has sort of collectively jammed into this um, one article. But the idea of leveraging all of the other information that's sitting around you to do a good job is um, it's really important. There's so much of it either within web analytics or within you know things like AdWords or other advertising platforms or within your own businesses you know, all of this silo data that's sitting within your business just begging to be used to do a better job. Um, and, you know, and they've been saying for years that things like big data is coming and everything's about enterprise this and cloud that and SaaS something or other. And, you know, um, there's so much data available to people that the challenge is not data. The challenge is actually making sense of it and getting, you know, actionable insights out of all of this disparate data that's in separate systems that's not neatly joined together in a relational database that you can just whack a SQL query against and get answers. You know, the challenge is finding all of these separate business systems that don't communicate together and finding ways to join them together so that you can get outcomes for a business to make a better business. Um, it's a challenge. <laughs> I can't count the number of systems that we have at our um, at my work that don't talk to one another that I, I wish wish <laughs> there was ways for us to just magically join dots together. Um, but it's it's just not that simple. I wish it was. Tim, um, I um, noticed that um, you had um, some um, um, praise praise of this article um, in, when we were in the green room earlier on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, um, you know, I love the thinking behind it. Uh, but there was, there, there, there was, there's, yeah, I mean, it could be a separate article all in itself. But the simple fact of the matter is you have to, you have to chase the algo. Um, it's just as simple as that, <laughs> you know. The, and and like Alistair said, that if if you think you can naively build content and 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 people will come, like Matt Cutts loves to preach about, that is like the the biggest load of bollocks I've ever heard in my life. Um, they won't come. You need to market that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a fantastic article, and you know, th there are so many bits in there that that need to be broken down and and looked at individually. But yeah, he did a great job of it. Mm, definitely. No, I know, I know you publish a, a lot of articles, Tim. Um, what about you, uh, Masataki? Do you write, write any SEO articles? No, not really. No. Um, but I think I think it was really good, and I'd like you, know, you have to go uh, go and look at the bigger picture. I think that's I think that you know, when people say chase after the algorithm, I think there's a tendency among certain subsection of SEOs that they are trying to sort of find this very small bit of something. So they're basically trying to reverse engineer Google's algorithm and then try to isolate a particular small bit that can then be used to increase their ranking. I think that's, you know, it's not that kind of chasing after the algorithm that Mike is talking about, in my view. It's really about making sure that you get the, sort of, the general shape, as it were, general direction. 
you know, you want to be as close in approximation to the thing as possible. But you're not going to be able to say, okay, this particular bit is, you know, accounts for X amount of factor in this situation. It's not like that. It's more about making sure that you know, you know, it's just like you know, trying to, what would be an appropriate metaphor or um, analogy. I suppose it is really like observing um, an animal. You find a new species and you're just trying to describe it and then try and see. You're not going to go immediately to the molecular level. You're not going to say, okay, you know, this particular thing does this. But you're starting with the shape. You're looking at what it does, where it inhabits, you know, how it moves, how it interacts, those kind of things. And then try to get a very good approximation as possible. And I think that's really important because build your site and they shall come. Is <laughs> as everyone else said, is not going to happen. And writing down the exact percentage for keyword density either. <laughs> yeah, I mean that. I think that that's that that symbolizes what is wrong with that the subsection I was talking about. It's trying to make it mechanistic. It's trying to basically, you know put certainty in, in a place where there isn't, you know, uh, fix something where there is fluidity, fix something when there are constant changes. You cannot just do that. That's why you have to be constantly on, you know, chasing after the algorithm in the sense that you observe it all the time. You notice the differences. It's not going to say, oh, the keyword density has shifted from X percent to Y percent, you know, big issue, rah. It's not like that. It is really being observant and making sure um, you know, where things are coming from, where it's going, and knowing what it is likely to do and how it behaves and so and so forth. So uh, that's why I think that's a thing, that's a qualitative issue. You're looking at qualities, you're not trying to look at sort of small, tiny specks, you know. And I think that that's the difference. And it, in that sense, I think it helps to think in terms of first principles and looking at what, what it does, how it does, asking the big questions to try to answer the big, um, the big questions, not trying to go microscopic uh, from the beginning, which I think there's a tendency among certain SEOs. Yeah. Yeah, OK, look, um, I think this might be a, a good time um... Um, to move on um, to um, another um, uh, article, um, but I, I must um, congratulate uh, Michael Fisher Kirstner, um, who's now blogging under the the, the, the pseudonym of um, um, the Data Marketeer, um, for a really um, thought-provoking article. Uh, and if uh, that's the first of them. The best is yet. Well, no, maybe that was the best of them. Oh, who knows? I always say the wrong thing. Anyway, <laughs> if that was a good article. Let's hope the the, the, the next uh, are even better. Um, the inimitable um, Pedro uh, Diaz um, um, made another post this week. Um, another one of. Um, about Matt Cutts, but it's not not not, not a, a Matt Cutts clip. Uh, it was an Eric uh, an Eric Eng uh, interview, um, and in it, um, Matt Cutts said, "Link building is not illegal or inherently bad," or at least that was the title of the, the title of the article. Link building is not illegal or inherently bad. Um, with Matt Cutts, I did have a read of the article. I, I um, thought it was pretty good. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I always like the um, the interviews that Eric does. Um, mostly because I think that you often get a little bit more context around things um, in some of the interviews that he does with people. Um, I, I don't know why that is. I, I'm not sure if he if the interviews are him talking to someone on the phone that he um, transcribes later, or if he does them over email, or however he might do them on the phone, I'm not sure. But um, I, I always liked them. I thought it was a good article, and it 
the extra sort of context and framing that you get out of those is, is really quite useful. Yeah. Okay, will we move on? All right. So, um, I'm going to get back on track to because I've answered a lot of questions out of sequence here. Rick Molinar asks, um, should rel canonical be added to every page? I, he says, uh, I've had an argument with a colleague who wants to add a rel can canonical uh, to any page pointing to the page itself, uh, except for some duplicate pages uh, which will point to the main page. Makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the way yeah, you should use it uh, nowadays, uh, certainly if you have uh, a content management system which has opportunities to publish on more URLs than just the one you thought it would, which I do see a lot. The, the other advantage I thought of, um, or at least I think it was also mentioned uh, in the discussion on the WCA questions community on Google Plus, uh, um, they, 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 they mentioned that uh, by using Rel Canonical, if scrapers uh, take your page and, and copy it, um, at least the Rel Canonical uh, is one more task for them to remove that. If they forget to remove that, at least um, they'll actually be helping you rather than um, hurting you. If I would scrape, I would uh, program that in uh, personally. Yeah. As one of the first steps. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not a scraper, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but well, it's I always know. best to have a canonical on your page. Yeah, I, I don't know if it would be really easy to program it because the, it, it, it's a link that, uh, it, the link that you could easily put an extra space in um, which would um, m make the string uh, you know two different strings um, or um, you know lowercase uppercase that, that sort of thing it would be e easy to um, um, they might use um, the, the double uh, uh, the double apostrophe or uh, Masataki, now you would know this. What do you, what do we call these things? We've got the two little dots, uh, the two little um, things that make up an apostrophe, and and the single one. What, what's the actual terms for those? I should have learned those in school, but uh, I didn't. Oh, you mean the uh, quotation marks? Yeah, quotation marks are the double ones. What are the single ones called? Um, aren't they called the single quotation marks? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure they, I'm sure they have a name, and I don't think it'll be single quotation marks. <laughs> anyway, you know, um, no, because if you, you know, if you need to, it's because it's LS quo and RS quo as, as far as I can remember. So I thought it was single quotation marks. Hmm. Anyway, Rick <laughs> Molinar, I, I, I hope um, that uh, covers. Uh, your, your question. Um, we, we all think here that, that, that um, I don't think there's any doubters, are there? It's, it's a good thing to have rel canonical when, wherever you, uh, whenever you put up a site. It, it just should be standard procedure these days. Is that a fair comment? Yeah. Apparently it is. Absolutely. Okay. Micah Fisher Kirshner um, um, made another post um, um, reg regarding. Um, Actually, I, I've, I've copied this question badly in, into my notes uh, because I, I haven't got it. But anyway, uh, it, the, the person asks, is it best to no follow links? Oh, there's a bad Matt Cutts, Matt Cutts article uh, about um, blogging and no follow links. And it, 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 um, there was a, a bit of controversy around um, um, Mark Trapagin um, made some comments. Um, uh, on it, um, I think uh, I saw Alistair Lattimore uh, chipping in at one point, and uh, Tim Capper also. Um, but anyway, yeah, the, the the thing was, 
I think it was this was a Matt Cutts clip. Uh, is it best to know follow links in the stories you write? Um, and Micah says good topics and points out that Mark uh, the points that Mark makes. Uh, um, he thinks that would be a worthwhile area to discuss, and I agree. Um, what do you guys have to say about it? <laughs> good topic, Mark. Originally, I mean, when I when I when I watched the Matt Cutts uh, clip, if you looked at what Matt Cutts actually said, he was pretty much saying the same thing, which relates to anything out there. It doesn't have to be um, an article, a published article. Basically, he's saying if the content's thin, two hundred to like four hundred words. Um, if it's a, in a, from a bad neighborhood, etc. So it generally applies to everything. And he's saying, yeah, it would be best to know follow. What it was, it was also John Mueller uh, was, was referenced in a webmaster hangout. And he didn't explain his, his answer. He just basically said, yeah, it's probably best to know follow. Um, look. I, th I think if you boil this all down, if you are going to have, if you are going to put a link into a really crappy, small, badly written, even a spun article, um, or whatever the case may be, the only site that's going to publish that are coming from pretty bad neighborhoods. And do you really want a link from them anyway? Um, if you're going to publish a decent link, uh, sorry, a decent article uh, that's highly relevant to the site. You're offering, you know, in-depth analysis or, or, or information on a particular topic, and you have um, a, a highly relevant link within that. I'm sorry, but that is what the web is built on. And to go and say no, follow it. Just uh, you know, I think I think it's that that it's just completely ridiculous. So. I think it just boils down to the the nature of the site that published it, the nature of the article, the nature of the link, whether it's over optimized anchor text. Then decide whether you're going to fo you know have that a do follow or no follow. Um, but to for 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 decent places, decent articles, great content, you know. Um, it's just it just makes no sense to ask us to to no follow these and uh, and I'm sorry I won't I'll let you know how I get on <laughs> I think the point here though is that the um, those links within a, a uh, guest post or anything like that they're not editorially given it's effectively a paid for thing it doesn't matter that you're not you're not personally buying um, the link, so to speak, you are buying it in the sense that you're contributing some amount of effort or equity, time, resource, money in assembling the guest post. You know, nothing is free, and you're effectively giving it to a third party. This is not that dissimilar to, you know, if you liken it to giving someone a gift for reviewing your. Sorry, I realise it's not physical. Yeah, but how, how do they, how do they how do they decide if that's a guest post? It's yes, some places will say it's a guest post, um, and other places, you know, will just have you know um, you know submitted by admin or whatever. In in those instances, how how can Google possibly say that that article was a guest post and then theoretically purchased, Easy. unless the article says it's a guest post. Easy. You you could you could even publish the article under your own like if I wrote a guest post for you, Tim, and I gave my article to you and you published it under your account, so it's ghost published as you, even though I wrote it, and it doesn't even make mention of the fact that it's a guest post. So your readers think that you wrote the article. Um, mm -hmm. Google can still determine that it's not you. How do you think universities detect things like plagiarism? Well, plagiarism is because something's being copied, you know, rewritten as such. Um, I, I think there's, I think there's some. Well, but then, but then, 
but then theoretically, everything is pretty much everything is. I mean, Christ, we know half of the the decent flipping search market, you know, search SEO sites out there are guest written well, or ghost posted. Uh, you know, just uh, sorry, Tim. Uh, sorry, just to interject no, here. <clears throat> I, I think you know it's pretty clear if the if you're linking to a Google property then it's okay to use do follow if you're not linking to a Google property then you should no follow that link so in other words if you're writing a guest post or you're writing an article on your own site to be safe you should only link out to Google prop a Google property so if you want to use your author ship to link to your you can use that that's great I think that's what it was intended to do everything else should be no follow I from my perspective because because if you're if you put a link into a article that you've written and Google can misinterpret that as an endorsement maybe and, and it and you that's just my it's, it's kind of what I'm getting here I mean if you if you looked at the totality of what Matt Cutts has said and what John Mueller has said in, in, in the interview that um, was done with Matt you kind of get that sense of you know them trying to get you to help they're trying to help you out and say just no follow everything so here's here's a little bit of some uh, some secret sauce that they won't tell you if you're running a if you're if you're running an SEO company or you're trying to help uh, clients with marketing and you want to get your know, word out and you want to get links on other other websites to point to you um, that's your kind of like your job right that's part of your part of your your quiver of, of arrows that you can go out and you can you have relationships you're building with other websites you hopefully that they'll give you some links maybe it's content maybe it's not that you're exchanging for that but somewhere along the line you're not going to get a link from a website unless you exchange something for it period nothing you will never ever get a link from from a website just because you're a nice person you you have to exchange a product or something for a link every single link is bought in some way shape or form if you link to one of my articles you're linking to it because you think it's a good article and it's helping you out so if I link out to a website it's because they've written something good so the only reason why I'm linking to it is because they've written something good that's an exchange for a link so if I write really good great content and I put it on my own website I'm really doing what I'm, ex I'm, I'm trying to get links in exchange for this really great content I'm putting there. I just, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's so, so crazy to, to, to put it into terms like search engine land, put it into and, and frame it that way is, is a little bit overreach from Barry Schwartz who wrote the article on search engine land. I think it's perfectly fine to go out and write guest post. In exchange for a, a link um, it's against Google's terms of service but I think you have to do it as an SEO person so but they've, they've said there's nothing wrong with guest posting M Matt has done a video on this basically saying right if you, if you guest post onto a site that's reputable the example he gave I think was someone like um, Danny Sullivan or uh, Danny or, Sullivan or whoever right doesn't matter right. It, I think in the video he used someone else but let's say it's a Danny Sullivan if if he goes and you can convince him to write an article for your site you should accept that article because he's awesome he's a knowledgeable guy and blah 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 and so you should know and if he links back to his site and sorry just to interject there but if he puts a link back to search engine land you should know follow that link no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. But according to what you know, but Danny's writing an article for my site. He's exchanging his article. If he puts a link in there himself, then he's exchanging that article for a link back to his site. 
And that's where the confusion lies because you, you run into the situation where how do you know that it was okay, that, that, that somebody's just doing it for the sole purpose of ranking. So it becomes an opinion and it becomes a, an overall uh, link backlinking profile situation where, where if you have a manual review and everything is coming from guest post and they're all coming from, from uh, or they're all basically the same articles. I mean, yes, a manual review can can see that. But if if I have a link from Danny Sullivan's site to me because I wrote a guest post and Danny says this is a great guest post, this is a great article he's referencing. Yes, it's on his own site, but I'm going to go ahead and link to it. Um, technically speaking, I'm exchanging that exchanging that content for a link, and you can make an argument that I didn't. But the reality is, is that's what it's going to look like, right? So you're throwing you're throwing it in there, saying, okay, well, as long as it's great content, as long as it's on a great blog, as long so as my, you're a great author. Yeah. So my issue with this, just in general, right, is that one, I think, putting putting it out there that you should just no follow everything, I think, is just ridiculous. Just in general, I think that's just ridiculous. But in this example, to, to go back to the examples I've given in the past where it's like Danny or someone like that, if Danny writes an article for your expressreach.com and he links back to, let's say he submits the article to you, right, at, in a Word document, and it's got a link, with, or it could have 15 links in it to all sorts of resources because Danny writes epic, long, 3,000-word posts, right? So it's got 15 links in it. And one of them or more of them happen to go back to websites that Danny has some involvement with. You could publish the article and choose to just not link them, not hyperlink the links, or no follow them at your discretion. The, mm -hmm. the thing is, though, right, you're choosing to carry that article because you, you endorse the author, ultimately, mm -hmm. because otherwise you wouldn't publish their content. Now, if the content is not relevant to your audience, because let's say it's about Britney Spears, you wouldn't publish it. And Google right. always say, if you trust the website, then let the page rank flow, right? If you don't trust it, like a comment, for instance, and it can't be verified, then no follow it. If you would be naturally inclined to endorse this website, whether it's a guest post or otherwise, Right? Just let the page rank flow because it's a good quality site. It it shouldn't be no followed. It's a you know if you're that worried about it, then don't even link to it. You know. Well, that's what I guess that's what my point is, right? Just, Why am I publishing something on my site and then have to no follow all the links, with the exception of of Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus? That doesn't make any sense to me. So the first the first question you have to ask yourself is is do I want this article on my site yes or no if it's and I don't care if, if I have a site I don't care who wrote the article is it relevant to my audience correct so so I could I could actually have Matt Cutts write an article for me but if but if and he could be writing it on SE on cats and it's all about his cats well if I don't want to publish his I mean what if my website isn't relevant to cats I'm probably not going to publish this article. So, so it really does come back full circle to number one: is the article any good? Number two: is 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 it relevant to my to my site? And am I going to endorse the links going out? And if and if I if I endorse the author, I endorse the the um, relevancy of that. And then I'm of course I'm going to let the page rank flow. I don't see why that has to change in any way, shape, or form. And it's been like that for years yeah. why would you change why would you why all of a sudden I mean that's what I don't quite understand is is why all of a sudden this well, is an issue can, that can people you are imagine, confused about if can, can you can you imagine the web if everybody now followed well no you, you can imagine it Tim because it's easy it'd be you would have no choice it would be exactly like it is today <laughs> yeah they would just they, they would ignore the no follow <laughs> I'm not being a smart ass. I mean, yeah, that was. You know, rewind before nofollow existed. There was links everywhere. Now, fast forward ten years, imagine, and let's just say the entire internet 
um, is no followed. Every link. Links are still a reputable signal, right? So all that Google is going to do is ignore the fact that any link carries no follow, and then base whether or not a link should carry page rank based on the relevancy, topical, authority, et cetera, et cetera, of the website. And then it will just come up and go, okay, this, we think this website's trustworthy. We're going to let page rank flow through the links, some links, not the ones in the footer, less the ones in the sidebar. The editorial ones in the blog content will flow full page rank um, because they have to. That's that's how Google's algorithms work. Links are still a massive component of their yeah, but um, then, ranking system. The Google will but, just come out with something like Google will just come out with something like super duper no follow, right? <laughs> you gotta have your no follow, then you have your super duper no follow, and then I I, I get what you're saying, and and you're absolutely correct. I think that. I think it's ridiculous to make, sometimes it's just not, I, I understand where Google's coming from because, it, or, or I understand where John's coming from. If you're putting out a bunch of low quality stuff, uh, you, you shame, on, shame on you, or uh, or more more to the point, you shouldn't be doing it, right? Because you're not adding any value to the web, the web as a whole. So you should be trying to do stuff that's halfway decent um, and is, has some value. But I think what they're really talking about is some really low end stuff, and you know, some of the some people pick that up and they just run with it. And the next thing you know, um, we should be you know, they're suggesting we should no follow everything. That your your quality content has to be so great that it has to be fifteen hundred, two thousand words. It has to do all kinds of special stuff. It just doesn't make any sense to me, and it's a long uh, it. It goes back before Google was Google, right? It, it, this some of this stuff goes back to the beginning of the internet. Um, it's you know links to, from one website to another website are the ecosystem of what it draw, makes the internet possible. And writing articles and putting it on web, websites is what started the producing content for for the internet. So. I think to change, I mean, it's okay to change those two things, but I think to negatively impact those by some of the advice that Google's giving people not to, to no follow and to do this and to do that, and people don't want to link out anywhere, I think is irresponsible. And, and speaking of search engine land, I just want to get this one thing out, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes what, and this really kind of bothers me, and I don't know if anybody else has seen this or not or, or experienced this. When when I'm reading an article in Search Engine Land and, and they have a and they're not doing it as much today as what they were in the past, but they'll have a link. And when you click that link, it goes to another article. You're thinking it, it's gonna go to an article that has that information, but it doesn't. It goes to another article on the site that ha it talks about that specifically and you you end up keep clicking around and you you really have a hard time finding the the link to the actual source and and news organizations in 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 especially here in the United States do that a lot and i think search engine land is is not as bad as some but you can but that's not really a good, great user experience it does it it solves some problems because you can kind of not link out, you're, you're internally linking, but it, it's kind of not a very good user experience. And I think you have to ultimately see, you have to ultimately think of your end user. And and if you have, if you're writing an article and you are using a, a, something as a source, whatever that may be, you should link to that source. And if you've used it in, as a source in your article, then by golly, um, um, unless it's something that you're talking about negative, you should do a do follow on it. You should follow that link and let it and let it pass page rank. Do you think uh, that um, you know, Google is trying to social engineer an issue that uh, they're not able to solve uh, algorithmically? Absolutely. I think it's simple as that. I think it's a it's it's an ad, it's it's like an ad campaign for lead paint. 
right? I, I mean, it's basically what it is. I mean, it's 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 not. Uh, well, I take that back. It's not basically what it is, but it's it's kind of like that to a certain degree where. Um, you've got a product that is not working quite right. It's not getting you the results that you want. Um, and the only way to fix that is to um, have a have a a marketing type campaign saying, "Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this." Um, and that's what they're doing. And and you know, ultimately, they're scaring the shit out of a lot of people because you know, a lot of people can count on Google. Is a search results. Even though there's 13 percent of the space dedicated to organic, some people actually need that, and they have people that work for them, so they get scared and they say, "Geez, I can't accept guest posts anymore." Um, so here's the thing I think that's funny about this, right? If if this is indeed what's happening, the guest posts that people are doing would represent an infinitely small percentage of posts on the internet and links as the global link graph that Google knows of, right? It would be completely irrelevant to the internet. But savvy businesses or, or websites or Mac marketers are using guest posting potentially to legitimately, in my opinion, increase exposure for their themselves or their business by guest posting and it happens to be helping drive their rankings up, which is no different than traditional marketing. You could go and spend a hundred grand with um, a radio or a TV or newspapers and do branding, or you could spend 10 grand or 50 grand or a hundred grand doing a massive content strategy, for instance. The net result is you're advertising to produce exposure for your business. It's just it's digital. It's not AdWords, but it's still marketing. The thing that I find funny about it, in terms of the fact that this, they could be socially engineering around a problem, like um, Jim asked about, is that it would seem to me as though the Penguin algorithm would be a perfect candidate for potentially, maybe not penalising a site, but um, devaluing links. So it, it doesn't seem like it's a stretch at all for me to say, Look at the links coming into a website. Look at the growth rate of different types of links coming into a website. Identify which posts are guest posts or which links are coming off guest posts. And then start saying, okay, this website has a relatively high percentage of guest post links which are producing value, substantial value to this blog. Um, I'm going to start discounting or reducing the effectiveness of this tactic for this particular website. You know, so guest posting in moderation is fine, and potentially Google might let all the page rank flow through the links from the um, origin website to the guest posts website, the guest posters website. But but you know, if if you scale it, which is Google's issue with all of these things, people able to scale guest posting out to dozens, hundreds of articles, um, they don't like it. But it seems as though you know, when they do the um, Panda algorithm, you know, they've got ways to classify content in, and use it as a ratio effectively of potentially the whole site's total content pool, thin, duplicates, etc., etc. If you look at the Penguin algorithm, they can look at link graphs and say you've got a percentage of um, good quality links, bad quality links, you know, it might time decay um, so that you can't easily flood a site with bad links and get it penalised. They can look at ratios of anchor text. They know what anchor text is commercial or non-commercial, branded, so forth and so forth, as a percentage or a ratio of your total link profile, um, total links, link text ratios, etc., and penalise someone. It seems completely plausible to me that they should be able to say um, these posts are likely to be guest posts. Um, and to potentially devalue some of the page rank that would flow through those links if they feel that it's a high enough percentage. And, and that's, that might be how they engineer around um, the issue. Because like, I, don't think that, I don't think that as a business you should have, if you guest post on someone's site, that the, all of the links should be no-followed. Um, because 
you know, I understand that it's a form of advertising from the from a business's standpoint that's writing the guest post. They are, they're exchanging their time and effort for a guest post. So the links are not editorially given. You're you're paying them with your time and money, effectively, to, to produce the article. So the links are effectively paid for. I get that they should probably be no followed in that context. I just don't think that they should be because if, if the article wasn't good quality or the author wasn't a quality writer, you would never accept the article, which means by all practical measures, this content could have been produced by Rob Wagner, but Rob didn't have the time to write it. I wrote an article and he said, hey Al, that's great, I'd love to publish that. Um, why, why, you know, if, if the content I'm delivering to you to express reach is relevant to your audience, why no follow the links? Uh, you wouldn't. You wouldn't because they're wouldn't. relevant. They're trusted. You know, and and if I included a link into a guest post that you felt wasn't relevant, you would just not link it. That's right. And I would, and I would have no say about it. You would just simply not well, I link. I would. I would take. The, I would hyperlink. Take it right out. I That's mean, right. I wouldn't even think twice about it. Neither would I. I wouldn't even bat an eyelid. But that's but, that's uh, so so what you're but that's going to end up being a quality site you're dealing that's with. Right. So so, so you choose to link from Express Reach to sites that you feel are reputable quality sites that you personally genuinely endorse. The sites that I chose that I wanted you to link to that you didn't feel are relevant or valued to your clients, you either remove the link entirely. Or no follow it. Your choice. I, I would care. I would remove the link because it wouldn't would make sense. I, I mean, ultimately, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna give me an article and you're gonna give me a link in that article, I I'm I'm really not gonna care whether it's do do follow, no follow, whatever. What I wanted what I want is relevant content. Right? That's my main goal. And if it doesn't make sense, if it's if you, you're linking to something that doesn't make sense, I'm just not gonna link it, period. Um, but I do want to bring up I do want to bring up one other point. Um, Tim and I were talking a couple days ago, and this and this is something that Matt mentioned in his interview um, with uh, with Eric. Um, I it was a guess uh, or press releases, and how Matt Cutts suggests that you don't do press releases, which is completely irresponsible on Matt Cutts. Uh, in my opinion, completely irresponsible and a lack of understanding business. Um, press, re press releases have been around for over 100 years. Companies use them all day long, and including Google. And but hang on. he didn't and, say don't do press releases. He said that the links from the press releases probably won't count, but that if the press release right, right. produces new links to you because the press release gets in front of journalists and writers, then good for you. But the links within the press release itself, follow or no follow, probably aren't going to get counted towards... They're not going to get counted towards your... towards your uh, for, for SEO purposes, they're not going to be counted. No, right? right. Which which I don't completely agree with that either. But, but this is the thing. You know, it's... Even if you took a little mum and pop store or anything like that, that you know... What is the basic thing of, of starting a business, running a business, or launching a new product line? You get the press in, you send out products, you, and the world we live in now ultimately is an article that's written by someone saying, I love this bag, and there's a link to your site. Now, through the whole unintentional way, you've actually paid for that link. It's... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 it is a minefield, and um, it's something which, yeah, it's like you said earlier. They're going to invent the super no follows. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, what other options do you have? Ah, it's bollocks. So maybe well, you have different degrees bollocks. of no follow. Or maybe you have different degrees. Maybe you have like um, no follow. Um, Defcon one, no follow. Defcon two, <laughs> no follow. Defcon three. 
I mean, let's classify them. You know, DEFCON <laughs> five is really that's toxic. So you're you're so so <laughs> I'm putting a toxic link on my website and pointing out to it, and I don't I don't want to have anything to do with it. But the link's there. DEFCON one is yeah okay well um, whatever. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. Either you link to somebody or you don't link to somebody. And I think yeah, the, the whole, the whole, that, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you, you know, you can make an argument for for blog comments, right? And and this oh, is yeah, just going back. Sure. You know, I mean, let's think about it this way too. I mean, how many people are using? How many people are engaging with blogs? I know I'm not. Like I used, to, I used to make comments all the time on 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 blogs. I don't do that that much anymore. And I think part of that is is you know, part of it is social media, but the other part of it is is it's a pain in the butt. I mean, you used to be able to go onto a, onto a, a blog, you would put your your information in there, and they would they would either uh, they would uh, you know post a comment or not. But now um, there's a, there's so much contention with it that you know people are looking at it and saying you know I don't even want to do guess I don't even want to do the comment thing anymore. So I've completely, I think it's a waste of time. I mean, unless it's a major site that I know that I'm going to have engagement with, I don't even bother making a comment. It's not worth it. I'd rather do it on social yeah, media. Yeah, I don't, I don't comment that often. Um, I did actually comment last week on a, a post in Search Engine, Search Engine uh, Land um, because, I, I, well, I had to tell them they were about a year and a half out of date uh, with their idea. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, like you, I don't, I don't comment much anymore. <laughs> I'm glad you straightened out Search Engine Land, though. Appreciate I that. I did. I told them they were, you, you know, they were talking about the concept of authorship and employers, and I said, mate, I published that a year and a half ago, um, and I've got the contracts and the legal and employment contracts. If you want to take a look at them, you know, <laughs> come on, get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but comment comments on forums are just yeah. If you're gonna comment, leave off leave off your website URL because that is definitely a DEFCON five. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that. I mean when I do make a comment, I usually typically don't even put a website in there anymore. It's no, no. Not no. Worth it. I did try and sneak in um uh an actually my relative author tag, uh, you know. <laughs> Just to see if I could take ownership of the article, but um, no, they removed the rel author. <laughs> you got to try these things. You got to, you got to attempt it. <laughs> Dodgy bastard. <laughs> <laughs> of course. What do you think we do all day long? We just come up with the schemes. I know. I know. Unbelievable. Anyway, gotta go. Okay, then. Alistair. Thank you for a great night. Cheers, yeah, Alistair. Another great hangout. Um, really appreciate your input, mate. That's all right. I'll watch the second half of this when I get to work in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take See care. You Cheers, mate. Good luck. Good luck with your new sites. Yep. Okay, mate. Okay, um, Lee Wheeler has joined us. Uh, he's uh, an SEO and PPC expert from Buffalo in New York. Do you have a mic, um, Lee? Uh, we do today, yes. How are we doing, guys? Hey, buddy. How are you doing? Real good, real good. Okay. Um, have we covered this? Um, we move on to a next? Yeah, sure. I think we've covered it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, uh, Mohammed. Um, yeah, 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 Yasser Mohammed has uh, asked an absolutely brilliant question. Um, it's how, how do larger companies rank in places pages for almost every local area there is? Uh, he says, hi, I am a newbie and I'm hoping someone can help. Uh, I'm a bit confused about Google Places for Business. Good luck, Yasser, so is everybody else. Um, I'm ranking well uh, in the places listing for the suburb I am based in. However, I have a mobile service and I'm wondering how I can rank in other local areas for the places listings. Everything I have uh, read uh, talks about on-site SEO, listing in as many business listings as possible. The higher the PR, the better. 
I'm getting Google reviews and ensuring uh, NAP is consistent and correct. And someone will have to explain to me in this question what NAP is. I have done most of this, he says. What else can I do? Uh, I notice a lot of other larger businesses seem to be listed in the places pages, even though their office is in a different state. How do they rank in places pages for almost every local area there is? Well, firstly, um, I just yeah. Firstly, he's he is ranking for the area he is in. Okay, so that is a result. If you are, that's a result. Now, uh, um, to go, f if you wanted to start ranking in areas um, which are further out from the area you're in, you're going to need that on your site. Um, now, it can get a, a little bit tricky if you're um, actually actually just thinking about it if you're mobile and you're on you know when you set up your places you can you can set that that marker can't you with a sort of a radius on there yeah there's a radius section but ideally you still need some form of geographical actual content on your site if, if you right, set the uh, radius the radius only works when you uh, don't have uh, a brick and mortar uh, store, and uh, no, it will place in the center of the city where you are. Yeah, I believe I believe the terminology on the Google Places is I. It's either click here if I only serve customers at this location, and click here if I serve customers away from my location, and then you can set the radius. Of how far you serve customers away from that location, but I think yeah. the trick also is, yeah, but I think the trick is also you're going to need on-site content. Yeah, you absolutely. are going to need a page saying I uh, also. I d sorry, did we say what he did? Did he t t say uh, I mow lawns in um, X area? these are the roads that I cover, these are my current clients in that area and I can fit you in on a Tuesday, Thursday and a Friday. Have your next page with I also mow lawns in this particular area. These are the streets in that area that I cover. I currently cover that area on a Wednesday and a Saturday. Um, these are my hourly rates. This is where I come, and these are some of the testimonials of my clients in that area. You know, house number four, five, and seven. So yeah, you need to create some form of relevance that Google can can equate to the area that you're working in. The problem starts when people start copy and pasting. Uh content pages and just change the, the yeah. place in it and that's what's but, happening all the time yeah for so sure but I never, I, <laughs> relevant unique content for that specific area and that's why I said Wednesday Thursday you're naming different streets you're putting some information about the current houses that you mow the lawns for blah 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 so all your content will be unique to that specific page and that specific area don't copy and paste and just say <laughs> just say oh lawn you know lawn mowing in London lawn lawn mowing in 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 Scotland lawn mowing in the, and then copy and pasting and just changing the word London and Scotland it's not going to work uh, it needs to be relevant and unique Good answer, Tim. Oh. Now go ahead. I don't have anything to wear. <laughs> okay. Um, does anybody else uh, have anything uh, for Yesa? Okay. Um, yes, sir. I, I, I hope 
um, that's um, covered it for you. Alien, um, Alien William asks, um, is forum and so social link building the issue these days? Uh, uh, he goes on to say, somebody help me with this. Uh, my website last week uh, ranked uh, all of the keywords on the first and second pages. But today I checked my ranks and all have dropped to the 10th and 12th pages. I checked the on page and it's fine. But I gave link building uh, to my brother and uh, he uh, um, focused on forums and social. Is doing more link building, is that the issue for uh, these days? If so, how can I recover? Please help. Remove all the links your brother placed. Yeah. Yeah. Simple as that. Mind you, he said but social, so I'm I'm assuming when he said social, I'm talking, you know, not some dodgy bookmarking sites, just you know, messages on Facebook and interaction and and on Google Plus. So I think those are right, but get rid of all the other links. Forum, Jesus. I think anyone that posts on Facebook should be penalised just automatically anyway. <laughs> they are. Didn't you know well, that? mate. <laughs> That's what got you in trouble two years ago, Jim. Pardon? <laughs> That's what got you in trouble two years ago, your posts What's on that? Facebook. It, 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 he got caught up in the Facebook algorithm. You think, you think that's what it was? <laughs> No, mm. just kidding. Mm. No, I think the only thing I've, I've um, I mean, look, um, all, all those naked pictures of me, uh, um, that, they, they photoshopped them. I, I promise you, uh, um, they're all photoshopped. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let's. Um, so, Alien. Um, I, I hope that covers it, mate. I, I don't know how long it will take you to recover, but uh, if, if, if you've been hit, I'd keep an eye on Google Webmaster Tools to see if you get a, a notification of a manual link penalty. Um, actually, that's something you should hope for because at least you've got a chance of um, recovering that way. But uh, if um, you've been penalised algorithmically for, for the stuff that your brother's done, you might as well... Um, I don't know. Um, am I right in saying this, guys? Uh, if, 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 if you don't get a manual link penalty, uh, drop that site and start again. Um, no. In, in my opinion, I'd prefer not to have a manual penalty uh, and just to be and just to be tweaked by the algo because I know I've got a uh, yeah. Because I know I can recover far faster from that, rather than having to deal with a human Googler to go over and check things, which is obviously going to be a lot more um, detailed than just um, you know just an algo. I mean that's my personal preference. So you know how the algo works. No, I don't know how an algo works, but what I'm saying is is if I believe I've been, let's say a particular page on a site has suffered, which you believe to think be, for example, Penguin, you know, you can you can look at your, your profile and say, oh shit, you know, look at that, I over-optimized those particular anchor texts, you can start removing them, etc. You can obviously stop, you know, maybe working on some better, some better links, um, and then wait for an for the for the next algo to 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 come through. If you've been hit with a manual uh, links warning, you know first off you've got a shed load of links there, don't you? So, but um, you you're physically going to have to, you have to provide evidence that you've that you've made an effort. You um, you know it takes a long time. You you don't just click the resubmit and say oh I've tried to. It doesn't happen like that. 
it takes a long time because it's a human that is reviewing your your cleanup act so I think it's more stringent than if the algo caught you you haven't had a manual penalty um, I think you can possibly say okay look there's a problem there um, and, and, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm either going to remove a few, I'm going to, you know, put some, some, some better links in there, I'm going to work, do you see what I mean? I might do, is it just me who would prefer an, an, um, an algo to a manual? I would prefer neither, but... <laughs> yeah, I know, but if one had to hit you today... <laughs> Then I, I would like uh, to have a manual one. No, I would too. Because they oh. are starting to tell you where to look for. No, mate, they don't. In which direction, links. No, they content. don't. Yeah, they I do. think I think I would take a I would take a manual penalty uh, over an algo because then um, at least when I submit um, the disavowal that they can see that and they can see my responses. Um, that's, I would prefer a manual. And I'm okay, just, yeah. A manual when you already have an algo doesn't work. <laughs> well, yeah, if you've been hit with an algo and you just go to XRunner and chuck another 20,000 shite forum guest post links at your site, I'm sure eventually you'll get a manual. <laughs> Yeah, but the the manuals, the humans behind the manual can't correct what's wrong with the algo. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. Yeah. Plastic too, did And another potential issue is um, the potential recovery time. I mean, if you're hit by algorithmic adjustments it could considerably take quite some time. Whereas manual penalty, could that be revoked pretty quickly if they accept your submission? Well, I mean, I've, I've never seen someone saying I've had an unnatural link warning for like a thousand links. It's always been in the big thousands. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it, how fast can you clean it up? Um, they want to see you clean it up. It's not like I can just go and chuck every single one of them into the disavow tool mm -hmm. and say, "Well, there you go." They're not gonna. They're not gonna have that. I think if you, I mean, I don't know because nothing's ever been published on it. But I reckon if you got anywhere from twenty to fifty percent of those manually removed, physically removed, um. And then you, they, 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 they might allow you to disavow the other fifty percent, but I don't know what the actual statistic would be on. I mean, in one of my cases, and it's the only one where I've used the disavow, but I still had to manually clean up seventy percent before the the other thirty percent was released. You know, with the disavow before the site was released, uh, and that still took four, five months. So, so even with a manual, you could still be sitting forever to try and achieve that, that, that happiness. And it also depends on whether the Googler who's looking at your thing got laid the day before. Uh, you know, because when you're dealing with a human, you know, you could have had an argument with his wife and just thought, no, sod it, go, go back and do some more work. Where you could have a guy on a good day and... Uh, <laughs> and he writes, okay, yeah, you've made an effort. You've only contacted two people, but I got laid last night. So, yeah, I'll let you off this time. Don't do it again. Well, I knew sex had raised its ugly head. Ah, uh, well, <sighs> these Russians. Um... <laughs> No, but seriously, because this is this is my point. That, that that's like I'm trying to make my 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 argument for why I'd prefer an algo over a manual, because I've experienced manuals, and it, it, it it's not that easy to get out of them. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, I, I, um, I think they, I, I, when when you said before about you know people with a thousand links and and multi thousand links, uh, I, I don't think that's a factor because 
like we've got 41 million um, links pointing against our shopsafe.com site, um, all uh, negative SEO. Um, and we've never had a notice, never ever had a, a, a manual penalty. Um, you know, I wish they'd give us a manual penalty so we could um, say, you know, stuff, screw you blokes, um, uh, fix this up, it's not us. Um, but we can't. I suppose all I can hope for is that uh, their partner uh, gets to hear about how they're treating me and you know, cl uses their toothbrush to clean, clean the underside of the toilet bowl. Um, that, that's about all I can hope for, a bit of karma. Anyway, um, have we covered this one? It sounds like it. So, well, here's an easy one, guys. Um, uh, Radal uh, Artida asks, where to start with on-page SEO? Hi, guys. I would like to learn on-page SEO. My question is, where to start first? Come on, this is an easy one. Make Adele, sure, um, make sure your your yeah. Make sure your your website's indexable, so Google can index it. I'd say that's the number one thing. Start there. The thing I'd say to Riddell, there's a um, a, a great um, um, it's like a training manual, really. Um, the, um, the Google uh, SEO guide. Um, it's a PDF. Um, I'll look for a link later and uh, put it on um, the page on the dumbseoquestions.com uh, um, page detail for this particular question. Um, I, I think that's what it's called, the, the Google SEO guide or something like that. It's the Academy. Is it? Okay. Website that's Academy. Changed. Okay. And Lee Wheeler says, um, site navigation, it's content, uh, H1, etc. cetera. Um, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, title. 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 Um, yeah, you need to have a title. Yeah. Or else you're, um, or else, you know, they, you don't want something on, in, the, in the search results saying home. Or, <laughs> yeah, you're nice, a nice, engaging title. And some one thing that people overlook a lot, uh, and that's canonicalization of your site. Uh, they uh, they often have uh, the dub 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 version showing, the non dub 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 version showing. Somebody told told them it would be a good idea to get widget.com uh, and point it to their site, and they got that showing as well, and the non dub dub version. And each time they, they add another site, they, they uh, um, suck a little a bit of power off themselves. Is that, is that a fair comment, guys? Yes. Okay. Google wants to see a site just on one place published and index it there and evaluate it there. Yeah. Here's a, here's a question, um, Tim Capper, that's um, right up your alley because I know or I have heard that um, you had a hand in um, Stephen Seagal's success. Um, <laughs> uh, it's how to bring fame to an important character on the internet. How to start. Um, Mustafa Al Sayed uh, wants to know. Firstly, you need to have a sex tape. <laughs> Actually, it's true. No, seriously, um, seriously. Well, most of them, most of them do, don't they? <clears throat> anyway, to to be to be serious, um, I'm assuming he's. I'm assuming he's talking about uh, you know in search results, obviously. Um, and not talking about, you know, some viral video that went live with that. What's what's who's that 
Korean geezer, um, Gangam, whatever his name is. Um, that was obviously, a, a, you know, from YouTube and, and that, that's how he went. So is he talking about social and search rather than just well, very general? He, he doesn't say, Robert. It's just a, a simple question. Uh, how to bring okay, well, an important character on the internet? Well, my first one would most definitely be um, Google Plus. I mean, that is my favorite. That's my favorite one at the minute, um, naturally. Yeah, because you you have the opportunity of um, the knowledge the knowledge graph and tapping into that. Um, you have you know the opportunity of tap you know tapping into especially pulling images from around the web of your guy. Um, you know, if you just search in any of them, you know, uh, Richard Brans Branson, uh, his is a really nice one with his all his social profiles are pulling into um, the, the the Google's knowledge graph for him. Um, so that is a really that, that's a really really powerful one. And after that, you can mess about with Twitter and Facebook, I suppose. Mm. Uh, of course, Wikipedia. Um, you know, uh, get yourself in there because that gets pulled through to the knowledge graph. Your YouTube videos will also be listed. Um, very interestingly, and I'm going completely off the subject, and I apologize for this. Has anyone seen the customer service numbers in the States appearing? Um, has anyone seen them? I mean, that is a really freaky knowledge graph thing. No, no I, I haven't seen them, Rob. But if you're um, searching, obviously, .com, google.com, um, and you will search something like Chase Bank customer service or Morgan Stanley customer service or, you know, any of these big, big ones, actually in the, um, just before the organic searches start, um, there's the massive customer service telephone number. It's, it's amazing. It's not in the knowledge graph on the right hand side. It actually appears physically above the search results. It's it's quite interesting. By the way, uh, can I ask a favor from our viewers uh, at the moment? Oh, look at that. Two of them just disappeared. I asked a favor and they bolted. Um, but. Uh, um, we're, we're just testing. You can um, contact us uh, on Twitter via using the hashtag uh, uh, DumbSEOQuestions and um, we, we've got a, a, a tracking page set up but um, I just want to test that it actually works so if the viewers could send us a cheerio uh, using the hashtag DumbSEOQuestions thank you very much I'd appreciate it. Um, we can move on to the next one. I hope um, you'll, you'll find uh, um, our offering uh, um, acceptable, Mustafa. If not, uh, please ask again on, on the Dumb SEO Questions community on Google+. Um, here's another one from Steve Johnson. Um, he wants uh, an SEO plan for um, online media or online magazine sites. Um, how to improve traffic, unique visitors for those sites. So um, I've done a little bit of publishing of um, online magazines um, years ago. Um, made a lot of money out of it. Um, these days um, um, can't really do much with it, but. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say. It's no good me um, ad advising uh, on um, online magazines because I can't uh, um, turn a trick with it, uh, Steve Johnson. Um, uh, hopefully, that. Um, uh, our team of expert panelists, um, or at least one of them, uh, has, has, has an idea or somewhere to start. Uh, 
somewhere to start would be to make known that you have them on all fora and uh, social media uh, that has a similar theme uh, about it. That's where I would start. The thing about magazines, though, Robert, is that I mean the, the very nature of magazines they they cover every demographic. I mean that's how they work. They they send out people to um, uh, canvas um, uh, the suburbs and uh, they interview people. You know, will you take this survey? And when they find a demographic that they haven't got a magazine for, they create a magazine for that particular demographic. You know, like um, you know, it might be. Um, um, black um, hamster lovers, and um, you know, next thing, and uh, we'll have we'll have a magazine for. And I didn't mean it that way, uh, Masataki. Um, I mean, people that like to breed, not breed with um, hamsters. <laughs> That's not good. That's not People good. like to breed anyway. Hand waving. Hand waving. <laughs> Just keep it on hand waving, Rob. Okay, uh, Steve. Look, I'm sorry that we didn't um, give you a good answer, um, but um, that's the um, the best we've got um, today. Okay, our last question, if I can find it, because I added it uh, after the, I have to refresh this page. Um, so I'll, I'll just see. If I have to do a search to find it. Um, it's a, it's a very, very good question because of um, um, some comment. Um, I can't find it in my report, so I'll have to go to um, the Damasio Questions community. Um, I'll read it from there. It's not a big one. Um, oh, I can't find it. Oh yeah, Maria uh, Marie Dahlia asks, "Does author rank um, really help rankings?" Did you guys see the the article this week um, um, where somebody did a, a, a complete breakdown um, and came to the conclusion that um, author rank does not help rankings? How can something that exists doesn't exist do anything? Okay, we can rephrase it again. Um, uh, authorship um, does not help rankings. Uh, I think is um, probably more to the point. Um, Mark Trapagin, uh, who um, has, has built um, um, a, a forum here on uh, Google Plus. Uh, wholly and solely on, on the basis of um, authorship and uh, its potential um, came out this week and uh, clearly stated that, it, that it's very clear that um, authorship um, does not help rankings. Nobody I saw, saw for that? too. No, I'm, I didn't see it, but I'm quite sure it doesn't help. Yeah, I, I am. But, um, Maybe I dreamt this, um, Rob Mars. Uh, maybe I, um, um, it was just a dream that I had. I was delirious and uh, it didn't really happen at all. Hang on, I'll go and look for a link, link, link for it for you. And Lee Willis said, uh, authorship has uh, the potential to increase uh, click-through ratio but not the physical rank. Totally agree. That's the answer I gave on um, the, the community a little while ago. Um, but I'll look, I'll, I'll look for a link. Uh, we, we don't have any more questions, guys. We've done a, a, another great job um, this week, and we've covered everything. Um, but I really would like to talk more about um, author rank. If I can find you a link. I thought that you actually um, commented on this, um, or it might have been W. E. Yonk. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. 
heavens above, maybe I did dream this. Uh, no, it's... Uh, okay, wait a minute. I think I found that. Um, just going to put the link in the chat. Found it. Um, I'll, I'll just read the details, or then I'll, I'll copy the post first. I, I hope this is not the same one as yours, uh, Masataki. What do they look like? About the same. They are the same. Well done, mate. No, no they're not. Yes, they are. Yeah, they're the same. No, they're not. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> okay, so um, um, from from the the uh, share, uh, Mark Trapagin uh, originally um, shared a post um, um, to the, the Google Authorship um, and Author Rank um, community um, with the with the headline uh, Authorship Markup. Uh, no correlation to ranking ability. And I'll just read out his comments um, on, on, on the, his reshare of this. Uh, he said, um, Google authorship, not yet a direct ranking factor, uh, Moz study. Um, I, I think, you know, um, yeah, okay. Mark says, um, Read the details below. This ranking correlation study seems to confirm my consistent uh, contention that having Google authorship is not yet, and that's um, in italics, a uh, direct search ranking signal in Google's algorithm. Well, look, Mark, my message to you is it will not ever be. It's just a means of um, uh, authentication. That's my opinion anyway. But, I mean, no. Um, anyway, he says he goes on to say that doesn't by any means mean that authorship is worthless at this point. Far from it. Among the present benefits are building of a personal brand or authority among people who frequently search for your content topics. Two, increased uh, click-through ratio for author snip, authorship snippet results that that are further down the SERPs page. And, and on that, I totally agree. Um, three, possibly increased ranking protection from sites that scrape your content. Bullshit. Um, no way. Um, how is Google going to work out um, when, like, who, who own, who, who produced the item first? If two, two authors uh, claim the same article. Four, uh, connection to your Google G Plus profile for those who want more from you. Okay. Um, five, strengthening the page rank of your G Plus profile by virtue of the authorship links from high authority sites where you publish your content. So, I mean, I don't see I don't see the value in that. Um, access to author stats uh, in Webmaster Tools. Well, I mean, anybody knows that uh, 
Webmaster Tools as Bread and Circuses and uh, Orthostats, um, uh, 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 what are they? They're just numbers uh, to twiddle your thumbs by. Um, and some type of author rank may still be in the cards for authorship, but it remains clear to me that at present it is not yet in play. And I'm saying it never will be. Um, and look, the the, the, um, the the other thing I'd like to go back to on, on um, Mark's statement, uh, really, you know, this bullshit about um, you know what your page uh, uh, rank is on Google Plus and um, you know what it does and and you know whether you should make your posts in a certain way because you know it, it inc increases your you know whatever juice that you're spending. I think it's a pile of crap. Um, I, I think I, look, I, I don't doubt that um, without a single link, um, um, you can use leverage Google Plus um, um, to um, um, make a site rank highly. Um, I mean, we're actually doing that um, with the dumbseoquestions.com site. Um, and um, th that um, you know is wholly and solely uh, um, from Google Plus, um, but it's the, the activity. It's the fact that Google Plus um, people with Google Plus profiles are um, using that content, and people that, with Google Plus profiles are visiting the, the dumb SEO questions community. Um, and so it's all social that, that's making that site. Uh, rank highly, but um, whether it's from, you know, because, you know, the, you, you put your, you, you plus this one day and take your plus off another or, you know, whatever other, um, you know, diabolical plans people have, um, I, I think it means absolutely nothing. Anyway, that's my mug's opinion. I'd be interested to hear uh, what you guys have to say. And I don't mind if you totally agree with me. Uh, um, or totally disagree. No comments? I At agree all? that it doesn't uh, have any ranking influences whatsoever. At the moment. Yeah. And for the time to be. Well, for but quite well, a why time. At, I'm sorry to, to be, be an, uh, hog the conversation, but why at the moment? I mean, you know, I mean, the, the, what, what is this? Uh, why would there be a thought that it's going to um, have something to do with ranking in the future? Just because you've got a, um, an authorship set up, how, how is that going to affect your ranking? Um, it, it, I mean, it, it's not Google that couldn't give a toss about um, um, you, the author. That they're interested in, in the, the object, the article, um, and you, the author. Um, are one of um, the, the uh, hundreds of signals going towards that particular article. Um, I, well, I thought I, they mentioned they were going to take reputation more in consideration. Maybe. I think, I, it, I, I think it could be some confusion. I think it does. Um, I think that if you do a search on Google Plus, I think it might have a factor, um, relevancy, and I think um, search plus your world, it might have some influence. I think beyond that, it doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't think it would ever, well, ever is too strong a word, but I, I doubt it can be introduced in the organic search settings, um, partly because of the competition issues that we have mentioned previously, that it would be wrong for sites that use Google Plus authorship to be favored in any way compared to other sites that do not have authorship set up. You know, that is, if, you know, if a website gets a higher ranking, just because it has authorship set up linked to Google Plus, then you could argue that Google is promoting Google Plus in another market in which it has a very strong market share, i.e. forcing webmasters to use 
Google Plus and set up authorship for their sites. So I doubt that it can be introduced in organic search anytime soon, if ever. Um, but I think it will be used increasingly uh, in Search Plus Your World or with Google Plus Search or any kind of personalized search that is linked to Google Plus in some way. But when will that happen? Ooh, who knows? And how will that happen? How much importance will be placed on authorship? How are they going to interpret? Um, you know, how are they going to interpret reputation? How are they going to value that? It's it's really complicated and um, challenging, and I think it's it's not going to be an easy project to pull off, even for Google. Yeah, I I I, I think that authorship is is really an enhancement um, um, on um, Google Plus. I mean. Google Plus is, is a means of uh, authentication. It, it, it's a means of, of um, establishing who you are. And an authorship um, is, is a means of further fine tuning or, or honing um, the knowledge that they have of, of, of the people who are um, publishing. But you know, uh, whether it's possible that, uh, like, if, if, if um, somebody pumps a spa spam article out today uh, under their authorship tag and um, um, is Google going to say, look, tomorrow this guy uh, doesn't get, get to rank anywhere? I don't think so. Um, th these, th these things that um, uh, carry um, um, the, the, the articles that this guy writes um, with his real author tag, it, they, they, they're published on other sites. They've got nothing to do with this um, particular author. Um, penalising that particular article because um, of, of, you know, of, of whatever perception they have of uh, the trust and reliability of that particular author, that's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. And there's more fundamental issue in that it, authorship is and the current setup mediated by a Google Plus profile. And you, know, you could set up a fictitious person to author materials in certain topics. You know, so yep. you could have multi in what well, is in actual fact multi author profile. So you have five or six people writing jointly using the same profile. And that profile would have a strong, you know, authority because that person has authored many pieces on the same topic of reading you know, good quality. You know, um, so it can be manipulated, it can be sculpted. So if, if Google were to introduce any sort of authority tied to the person, then they have to tie back to the natural person. But that would be, you know, the, the privacy implication is absolutely terrible. Mm. And uh, for that reason, I don't think they can do it. And let's face it, it's like links, it's, if you, if it's mediated by something like a Google Plus profile, it is going to get manipulated. It is going to get abused. And if Google were to place importance to profiles and to authorship as represent, and if you like, the authoring to be mediated by the presence of Google Plus profile, then that's you know it's going to happen. I think some people are already working on creating a authoritative, fictional profile at this moment in anticipation of you know, some sort of author rank or agent rank coming into force. And Google would be none the wiser. There would be no reason for Google to suspect that it's not one person behind that profile. You know, it, it, what, how can Google then uh, decide from the fairly limited information that it will have about that particular person, a particular profile, to ascertain with reasonable confidence that 
that profile is in actual fact a fake. If it has a, you know, if it passes the duck test, it sounds like a natural person. It engages and writes like a natural person. How is Google going to know? So I think there's inherent limitations in using authorship, Google Plus profile, and author rank. That's why I don't think it will become as big as people think it will be. I think that it will be introduced in some form, and it will be used in some way. But I do not think it's going to be the thing that's going to completely change how things work, because it is, it can be manipulated, and it will be manipulated. It is probably being manipulated at this moment. That's my view. Yeah. Of course, I, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a second that um, people not do author rank. I, I mean, with our clients, uh, it, it's the, the first thing that um, we suggest they do. And, and um, if, if they uh, aren't able to do it themselves, we'll, we'll set it up for them. Um, I, I think it's important, and, and you know, I, I um, encourage people to use communities like Marks um, um, to deal with the, the, the finer points of it. Um, the, the only bit that gets me, it, it's, I mean, it's it's like snake oil, isn't it? Um, to to um, attach uh, some higher importance to what's really just a, a basic piece of the plumbing. Um, uh, the Google Plus profile is, is a piece of uh, authentication. Um, the um, authorship um, is just one layer on, on top of that. Um, but it's, it's all to do, in my opinion anyway, simply to do with authentication. For people to say it's going to make you more money, uh, um, I think it's crap. Unless you're you know, a, a very famous author. but. Uh, I don't, I don't even see um, that that you know that that's um, um, much anyway. Because well, look at looking at another way, there are some very uh, famous authors, um, um, and and there are some highly respected people in, in SEO um, that um, my authorship um, is is beating. Uh, for particular, you know, tiny searches. Um, so, and um, I, I know nothing about SEO, and yet my photo as as an author is appearing um, in searches for SEO related queries um, because we do this um, hangout um, and and we talk about SEO. But um, we, I don't, I don't have um, any skills in SEO. Um, it's you know, it's not that uh, they're, they're, they're um, placing us higher um, because um, Google perceives us being more, more valuable. It's because more people are, are um, going to the WCA questions community. It, it's social, social signals. I think so, anyway. No, Robert, it's not because um, I'm re relevant to the search, um, totally ir irrelevant. Well, I, I, I think that's where the confusion lies. Because if, if you're doing dumb SEO questions, you're talking about SEO questions, and you're, you're relevant to SEO, the, the fact that you're, the knowledge is, is not relevant, it's the fact that you are all about SEO irregardless of what your knowledge is. Correct? So if, if everything you, you're talking about online is about SEO, you're very relevant to SEO, you have the largest SEO community on Google+, Plus, or not, maybe not the largest, but for the market space that we're talking about, uh, SEO questions, you're very relevant. That doesn't mean that you know you you're all knowing about SEO. That just means that everything you write about and talk about online, not everything, but it's very relevant to to the search term. Very relevant. But so if if Google is using 
um, was or was using uh, authorship um, to establish um, any form of quality uh, of an author uh, to gauge anything of quality, um, the, then um, that, 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 that theory, uh, um, I mean, this experience it proves proves that, that that can't be so. Would you agree with that? Uh, ask the question again. Well, Lee, Lee uh, just typed into the chat, I agree that Jim is tied to the SEO search regardless if he personally knows anything of SEO and, and uh, I can promise you Lee I am clueless. Um, well see that's, but, that's where we, that's where I'll have a debate because you're not clueless. I mean that um, might be your perception but that's just not, that's just not factually true. I think you do know yeah. a lot about SEO um, and yeah. you facilitate, you facilitate a huge amount of of value in the SEO community. So you're looking at it from the standpoint of, geez, I really don't know SEO that well, but you know, what value do you bring to the internet? All right. So compare it to some, I mean, compare it to some of the, some of the basic questions that we get asked. Um, you know, how do I rank really well for um, my website? I have 10 pages on SEO or online marketing and I want to rank really well for, for, for you know major search terms. Well, what value are you bringing to the internet? What value are you bringing to that search term? And I would make the argument that the value that you bring to the internet for, for that space is very relevant and very useful and it, nobody else is doing it like you're doing it. So obviously, I think you're gonna rank high relevancy and bringing value and in a little bit different I mean what you're doing with um, the website and how you're presenting it is it brings a tremendous value an overwhelming value compared to a lot of other sites correct I mean it, it, that's my opinion and I, I think you should rank and you're um, I, I think you're you're also you're bringing in other people in the industry as well. You're not trying to do it alone. You're not trying to manipulate anybody. You're 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 bringing you're you're bringing in very well known people in the industry. You're very open, and the way you present it is is different and brings so much value. Interestingly, yeah. Jim. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't, I don't mean to inflate your head even further, but um, I was just searching some of the, you know, on the sidebar, some of your, you know, uh, questions listed uh, on the site, and I mean, you're ranking for some serious, serious terms. I mean, and the I'm, site deserves I know, it. That... I know, he says. I fucking know. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, 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 I was but amazed the other it. night. Uh, the, the, no, well, that's, that's it. I don't think we do deserve it because... No, um, but you're doing something no... different. I've never seen a site offering up questions with um, and sectioning it out into video section. And yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that done, especially in a, like a, on an SEO site. You're bringing something new to the party. And and that uh, not, not and that is new, one of the not, not just new but very valuable and yeah, user friendly. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah definitely. But, I mean, what, what I'm getting at. I mean, Google we, is we, going we, to kill the site once they once. <laughs> Google's going to kill it once they hear us slagging off mad cuts and 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 all them fucking other wankers. But apart from that, <laughs> um, you know. No. <laughs> But apart from that, you know, I mean, it, it does. It brings a lot to the table, and I'm, you know, seriously impressed on how the site is developing week and week out. So let me ask a question. I mean, if you're if you're basically new to SEO, and you, or if you're a site owner and you need to learn, uh, and you go to the webmaster Google webmaster forum and you go to the and you ask questions, you're going to get torn apart. If you come to SEO questions, you're going to get a well thought out answer. You're not going to get torn apart. You're not going to be raked over the coals. That's a complete different perspective as well. 
no disrespect to the top contributors on webmaster forums i don't want to go down that road but i think that the value there is tremendous and if i was starting out in seo and i could find the community i would be in with both feet and i'd be asking so many questions because when i started in seo it was a different time and different space but um at some point when you start something you don't know anything and you have to learn and and you know where else are you going to go that gets that kind of interaction um, in the in the in the form that you're presenting it is so special. I'm not saying there isn't really good good websites out there like uh, like Moz, right? Moz is really great. You can get a lot of great answers there at Moz, but they don't do a four hour hangout every week. Well, they they do sort of. Um... I mean, really, if you if you distilled uh, our our clips down um, to um, actual content, um, um, there's probably a, probably an hour of um, beef uh, in inside the broth. Um, but um, they they do every every week do Whiteboard Friday. Oh sure. So how can I? Uh, so let me ask you a question. How many people uh, and, are in? Actually, this is my main point too. Too. I, I sorry sorry to interrupt. Uh, and I do respect what what you're about to say, but uh, if if I don't tell you now, I'll forget it by the time you finish. Um, that, and and that is, um, um, we would not be talking about um, this now. I mean, people have been talking bullshit about authorship for for month after month, and we. Couldn't say anything. We just have to bite our tongues and and, and listen to the crap, um, and and just suck it up because you know we could not speak out um, against it because we we have no credibility. But Moz, one week in one week, uh, Moz uh, you know um, publishes some findings um, that there is no correlation between. Uh, authorship and ranking, and automatically, the, the the concept of the authorship being valuable for for ranking is dead. Um, now that's um, what I'm talking about. If authorship really meant anything, we wouldn't be beating Moz for some terms, and and yet we are. And that see so that that doesn't add up. No, well, I, I agree with the, the last thing you just said, but I also think you're comparing apples to oranges because if you're if you're comparing Whiteboard Friday to an interactive hangout, that's two completely different things. All right, so that's number one. It's completely different. Uh, Whiteboard Friday picks their topics. Whiteboard Friday doesn't have any interaction on a hangout. It's not a hangout. Number one. Number two is is we're not doing original research either. So we're not we're not saying, hey, look, you know, we're going to do all this research. We're going to present it in this forum. We're in a, kind of a different niche there than SEO mods, correct? So we're not we're not saying, okay, let's all do our original research this week and then present it on a hangout. What we're saying is 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 we're let, allowing users to come in and ask questions, and then we're inviting experts and we're inviting other people to come in and engage. It's engagement that, yes, Moz has forums and everything else, but it's not the same engagement. Um, and and we're not doing the original research. But that's not to say that we couldn't, if that's the direction we're going in. And also look at, um, look at it from the standpoint of how long Moz has been doing this and how much money they've been putting at this. I mean, they're, they're funded, they're... They have a lot of resources, and this is all—it's um, a completely different thing. And and I think we should be, uh, we should be, Moz on certain search terms, quite frankly, because we bring something that's better than Moz to, on certain things. Not everything, but certain things. Hmm. But there, there is a website um, with heaps and heaps of peer-reviewed good data. You know, like you don't get crap on Moz. Um, there's just heaps and heaps of of respected 
um, peer-reviewed data, and, and theoretically that's what authorship um, would be all about. So, you know, when, when Rand Fish, Fishkin um, um, puts his authorship on something, um, and it's an SEO-related term, he should be number one. Yeah? Um, for what? For, for, for an SEO-related term. No, not necessarily. It depends on what that term is. Well, right. anything is, is, is. I mean, Moz is SEO. Moz. Um, I mean, Moz is so so synonymous with SEO that their their name used to be SEO Moz, but they dropped that um, just to be Moz. Um, I mean, if if you think SEO, you automatically. Th yeah, I mean, you, 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 if you hear the word Moz. You automatically think SEO. Yeah. By the way, this is hand waving. That is. Um, um, but um, you know, so it, it's it's just all around the world. That, that that's it. So if if authorship had any credence whatsoever, um, anything with um, 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 Rand Fishkin's name on it should be number one for any SEO-related term. Like Wikipedia is, is, is number one um, for um, just about any term in the world that's not a shopping item, in which case then, then it'll be Amazon. Well, it just means the algo uh, sucks. Uh -huh. Mm. Uh, I, I, what kind of terms are we talking? I mean, yes, I, 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 I mean, if you're ranking, give us a term, and then you, you look at the content behind that, right? So pick a query and say, okay, we're outranking Moz. Now take a look at the content that Moz is bringing back, and take a look at our content, and then the chart, you know, go from go from there, and the relevancy of the overall. Um, Search query to what, what we're talking about. Well, if you feel, um, give me some leniency. I, I, I'd rather not um, um, have the embarrassment of, of, of displaying my absolute naivety in, in SEO. Um, <laughs> um, if, if, if that's okay, but um, if I can just put it this way. I, I, I was testing the other night and um, just just doing um, terms terms that we shouldn't rank for um, that we are ranking for or at least in, in my opinion and and beating um, sites which should be ranking above us um, they're below us and okay. with, with 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 author rank uh, at, with author rank uh, attached to both um, to both um, searches, so you know, in in you know, I, I really think that authorship counts for naught. It, it's just a means of authentication, um, and I, I think that people that um, g people up and charge them to improve their author. I mean, authorship is just something which is either on or it's off. It's either working or it's not. And I see people. Wanting to charge other people to enhance their authorship. You know, I mean, this is real bullshit garbage. Um, this is con man stuff. Um, it just shouldn't be happening. Um, and thank God, um, Moz came out uh, this week. Um, hopefully, we'll see less of it from now on. I, I, I'll agree with you on that point. Hey, we've got about um, 20 minutes of viewing time. This is a real luxury that we don't normally have, guys. We've got um, time that we haven't covered. Um, anything? Um, oh, Masataki, did you want to talk about um, the problems you've been having with hot linkers? No, not really. It's it's nothing new, as it were. Um... I wanted to ask you, um, do, you do you have um, um, a, 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 
an Apache server or an IIS server? Apache server. So I'm basically um, redirecting um, um, to another image, um, but it's being copied and uploaded. So I, you know, then I have to pursue them somehow if I'm so inclined. Um, the problem, of course, is that the, the the person who's running the website is in Indonesia. The domain is registered through a company in the U.S. and it's hosted a, by a company in Canada. So if I were to go after this site, um, in terms of actually getting things down, then I'll probably have to go to the hosting company, which means having to formulate a request in a way that would be um, reasonably how it, um, compelling um, under Canadian law. So I don't know how, if or whether I'm you know, going to pursue that because it's you know, a couple of images and I don't think that this particular site is ranking anywhere near but I just see a few lines in my logs every so often and that's why. It's, it's more about being annoyed by the fact that someone aggregates huge amounts of images and then hopping into them and then plastering with so many ads that your eyes pop. Um, it's, it's more that annoyance value than anything else but I can see that for some other sites it could be problematic because if people are making a living from selling images, for example, then having those hot linked or downloaded and uploaded, uh, that, that, you know, that's a serious problem. Okay. Um... I remember seeing something uh, um, over on um, Helicon Tech, um, the people that write, do a SAPI rewrite, they've got a specific product um, that um, deals with, with hot linkers and might even, I mean, once they've got the image, of course, there's not much you can do, but I, I think the hot linker, um, um, you know, will cut out most of it. You, and you won't beat that bloke in Indonesia, but you'll beat the people that just won't, won't want to use up your bandwidth and publish your images on their site. Yeah, no, it it hap it's it's been happening for quite a long time. You know, I can remember that happening, you know, almost ten years ago or so. And you know, you get used to it. You just block certain sites. You know, block blog post uh, blogspot dot com for example. Um, in the end, there isn't much you can do about it. I mean, you, know, you have to accept that you know, if you put an image online, then the likelihood is that it's going to be used by someone else. Um, mm. Fair enough. Rob Mars, I, I see the post you posted in the um, chat here. Um, in, in Australia, I, I, I don't see the same result as you. Um, uh, oh, hang on. You, you've you've linked to um, Australia. Uh, that you're using Google.com today, you Rob. Rob Mars. Y yes, and if I look at in incognito, uh, I see what I see. Uh, I tried to screen share, but it didn't work. I'll I'll, 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 I'll I'll share my screen. And I hate this. I'm such an incompetent dope. Anyway. Hmm. That's much better. <laughs> yeah. He's um he's right down there. Um actually if I go um go go back um yeah, we'll go to the top of the page. Um 
there's um, Dan Petrovic, number one, um, the mm -hmm. SEO ninja. Um, I don't know, my, my, one of my plus posts, um, number two, I see um, um, Tim Kappa's um, site, number, number, this is domain crowding, he's got two in a row, three and four. Um, DumbSEOquestions.com is uh, five. Uh, Aaron McKay, six. Then you, you, your own site, Rob, is seven. <laughs> um, and um, seven and eight. And uh, your your blog spot um, is uh, nine. And is that the um, idiot, uh, that one there? No. Um, that, that, that's the idiot me. <laughs> oh, this is you. Well, I'm, Okay, well, uh, I don't see him anywhere on the page. No, that's strange. Um, for, for anybody that's watching, um, uh, or if, if you want, it's a reputation management yeah, you issue. Yeah, you can throw it um, out in the open. Um, where, uh, um, pardon? You can throw it out in the open. I'm, I'm through with it. If you, uh, you you don't know want me to talk? Yeah, yeah. Um, talk. Okay, no, well, um, Rob um, helped uh, somebody on um, the um, Dutch uh, AdWords uh, forum, um, gave some assistance, um, and um, then the guy wanted uh, Rob to do something uh, um, on a paid basis, and, and that relationship soured, and... Uh, He's been um, 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 stalking Rob um, ever since, and we um, 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 Tim Capper, uh, being the online reputation management specialist, uh, recommended that we we build some pages uh, um, to um, rank on top of um, the stalker, and. We'll, from, from in, incognito, my view here, I don't see that, Rob. So um, this is personalised search working, isn't it? Even though it's incognito? Because if, if you're looking on google.com.au, I should say, um, and I'm looking on google.com.au, um, I don't see that guy's site um, in the first 10 results, and yet you, you do. Um, is that some sort of personalised search, some sort of influence that, that puts his site there in your view but not mine? Rob? On, um, I think. Dot on .co.uk incog, that guy's is number 10 for on .co.uk. Hmm. I think Rob's connection's frozen. And, no, I think um, my mic was muted. Ah, okay. Doesn't that sound yeah. familiar to you, Jim? Oh, yes, 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 it does. <laughs> but uh, your actual vision on the, the little bit at the bottom of the screen, uh, you, it's just showing your photo at the top, and, and the vision is, is, is frozen. Or is, am I the only one that's seeing that? I see myself moving. <laughs> no, it looks frozen to me. Move your head. No, it looks <laughs> frozen. Not. Moving, uh, <laughs> flying like a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't see it, mate. Uh, that probably happened when I changed over to screen share or something. Um, but if I'm looking, just searching for market biz. Because I, I, I now finally had a client who said uh, they didn't do, want to do business uh, because of what they found on the internet.
But we came to uh, to do business anyway at the end. Yeah, I see it on fourth place now in Google.com. Yeah, but on um, Dakota UK, just searching market biz, it's not appearing on page hmm. one. Um, That's fine. If you do mass market biz, uh, um, 